Chapter 401 Tough Customer's Night was slowly sinking into the horizon, giving way to dawn. Roy returned to his bed and concentrated on his character sheet once more. Skill point goes to meditation again. Meditation level 7, level 8. Every time you perform a complete meditation cycle, you will gain a charge of activate. Activate heals you for 40-50% of your HP and mana. Constitution, 22.523 HP, 305-310, Spirit, 20.521, Mana, 285-290, Stat Point Allocation Confirmed, Will, 2021. 20, Roy closed his eyes and felt the changes in his body. A sigh escaped his lips and he opened his eyes. A strip of white light protruded from the horizon, breaking through the gray skies. Cold winds came in from the seas beyond, waking those whom it kissed. The young witcher turned around, but Ixena and Cohen were still fast asleep. Amused, he shook his head and tucked Griffin away into his hood, and then the young witcher tiptoed out of the room. Beyond the snow-covered courtyard sat the cliffs that overlooked the seas underneath, and on the cliff, Keldar stood. His back was turned to Roy, his attention fixated upon the raging seas underneath. If Roy didn't know better, he would have thought Keldar was an ancient statue that had overseen the ocean for eons. There was history sleeping within him. Long, complex history intertwined like spiderweb, and yet this supposedly human being didn't feel alive at all. Did you find anything, Keldar? Roy stood beside the Grandmaster, sparing him a glance. Do you know what caused this? There was melancholy in Keldar's eyes, but also reminiscence and reluctance. Reluctance to part with something he held dear. I have you to thank, lad. Thanks to you, I've found something I've overlooked for far too long. Alas, you must forgive me for keeping this a secret. Your question must remain unanswered, for revelation would mean bearing the school's secrets under the sun, Keldar said. And you must leave Kaer Saren as soon as possible, before night descends. Are you joking? Roy cocked his eyebrow. His arms were crossed, and his eyes were filled with interrogation. Is this how you treat your guests? You expect me to leave without getting an answer? That is the way of the world. Fate throws hurdles in your path, hurdles you never see coming, and fate will never change for anyone, Keldar answered coolly. Should the chance present itself, we shall duly compensate for the damages our school has caused. What did I do wrong? Roy refused to give up, a hint of anger flaring in his eyes. Was it because of my idea of the Brotherhood? Do you see me as someone with such a narrow mind? No, this has absolutely nothing to do with your proposal. Yes, the Brotherhood is ostentatious and a transgression against the laws of nature. Yes, it treads dangerously close to the territory of political meddling, but it is not totally worthless. I will not interfere with your operations, but nor will I join you. That said, you have performed perfectly. Keldar's eyes never moved from the seas, and a sigh escaped his lips. Too perfectly, in fact. That is precisely why you're in mortal danger. Last night's assault was a mere taste of what is to come. It will not stop until it claims your life. Who's behind the attack? What is behind that attack? Roy kept asking, refusing to back off. And why did it come to me? What does it wish to gain from me? If the coming attackers are on par with Kosti, I'll be in danger. The details are top-secret information, on the same level as the secret arts. Forgive me, but I cannot divulge any information. Once Cohen and Ixana wake up, bid your goodbyes and leave, Keldar answered calmly, and send my regards to the old chap. A frown furrowed Roy's brows. God damn it, this geezer is obstinate. Something's off with him, and something was wrong with the history Cohen told me. This guy is hiding something. Roy held his anger down. For now. Can I come back to Kaer Saren again? That I cannot answer for sure. Perhaps the threat will be gone in the nearest future. Eldar didn't give a straight answer. I'd like to invite Cohen to Novigrad. To see how the Brotherhood works. Cohen is his own man. He can make his own decisions. If he so wishes to, I will not stop him. Pardon me, but before I leave, may I take a look at how dual signs and roar work? Roy licked his lips. If this were in the past, I would have let you read it, but not now. The knowledge it contains is dangerous. It? The knowledge it contains is dangerous? So it's a book. Roy found himself a clue. So that's it? I may never see that knowledge again? It depends on what destiny wishes to put in our path. Okay, that answers nothing. What does that entity have to do with the book? 
And what on earth is that thing? Why is Keldar so wary of it? In just one night, he becomes a pessimistic hull of himself. Now he's trying to chase me away, citing that the future is uncertain. Roy tried his best to get more answers, but Keldar refused to provide any. The look on his face remained melancholic, and his tone stiff. When dawn finally broke, and golden sunshine shone upon the snow, Keldar returned to his house. Roy caressed the stone stele, his eyes set on the seas and the horizon. He rode his train of thoughts, but that was quickly cut short by sounds of hurried footsteps closing in on the fortress. Keldar was standing under the overhang, his arms crossed before his chest, the look on his face turning from melancholic to solemn. Cohen and Ixena left their bedroom. The lady was rubbing her hands, her ears and head covered with a fur hat. Her cheeks and nose were red, and an oversized cloak hung over her. Roy thought she amusingly resembled a kobold. The four of them stared at the slope leading up to the fortress, and out came a silhouette. Then another. And another. Eventually, twenty men in gray cotton jackets appeared. They were armed with hoes, pitchforks, and pickaxes, huffing and puffing like angry creatures trying to tear their prey apart. Roy snarled, for he noticed two disgustingly familiar faces amongst the crowd. The man with green hair, and the one with the red face. The elderly man in the lead had a face as wrinkly as an elephant's hide, his skin roughened up by the elements. His beard was unkempt, his body was gaunt, and his back was hunched, not unlike a typical countryman. But his eyes were violet, and the man was staring at the front doors of the fortress. When he locked eyes with his daughter, he gnashed his teeth and muttered curses under his breath. All the color drained from Igsina's face. She quickly let Cohen's hand go, but the witcher held her tighter. Unhand me, daughter, ye mutant, lest we clobber ye. The old man spewed curses at Cohen, though he was about as threatening as an alpaca. The witchers remained silent. What are you guys doing, Raid? I never asked you to come. Ixena quickly explained, I came here of my own free will. Nobody forced me. Ye old man's here, you idiot girl. Airy one's here. Those mutants ain't gonna hurt ye. Come back. Yes, Ixena. The green-haired guy who fucked his friend the whole night stepped in. There was smugness in his eyes, but there was also a hint of darkness. The mutants deceived you with trickery and lies. We're here to save you, to free you from their clutches. Come back. The men roared and shouted, but none took one step further. You must be the villagers of Charcoal Borg. Perhaps this is a misunderstanding. Keldar gave the angry villagers a look as calm as still lake water. Matter-of-factly, he said, my student embodies the virtues of a knight. He would never abduct anyone's daughter. That right there is proof, ye lying twat. Raid pointed his pickaxe at Keldar. That's me daughter there. She's a sweet gal, and there ain't no way she'd scurry off to this here mountain without so much as a word. Why, this place is more run-down than a doghouse. A woman and three men staying in a fortress all by themselves? What is this, a whorehouse? The men swung their farming and mining tools, shouting at the witchers. He, Nanarai, said adamantly, If you ask me, that guy with different colored eyes and pockmarks on his face must have been the kidnapper. That's right. The man with a red face looked at his comrades and announced, We've seen it. We've seen how that mutant bewitched Igsina. They were at the river, and Igsina was spasming like she had fits. That mutant had flames all over his body. We saw how he cast a spell on her. He convinced her to steal from her family and give all her coins to him. Henry, cud, you curse, you sons of bitches, Ixena cursed loudly. You criminals almost defiled me. How dare you insult me? She roared at her father. Don't listen to them. Those bastards tried to defile me, but fortunately a witcher was passing by and he saved me. I'd be nothing but a cold, dead corpse if not for him. Raid cocked his eyebrow and looked at the men suspiciously. The man with a red face turned around and spread his arms. He spoke loudly, his voice as grating as rusty chains turning around. Look here, people. See how the witchers have bewitched the girl? Do you see how they have manipulated her into thinking we're the villains here? Henry and I spent a day and a night searching for old Raid's daughter, and just when we were about to save her, she accuses us as criminals. This is preposterous. Snap out of it, Ixena. Stop your lies. Henry stared at the ground and shook his head like he was actually sad. If we had actually tried to defile you, we would have run away instead of coming straight to you. 
Do you think everyone here is a fool? Someone shouted. Raid, your girl's brainwashed. Raid's face was like thunder. With his pickaxe in tow, he approached his daughter. The young men who followed him also took one step into Care Saren's land. Roy cracked his neck and wrists, his joints popping like firecrackers. The young witcher advanced toward the incoming villagers, and it silenced them. They were reminded of the witcher's rumors, of how inhuman their strength was. Roy possessed strength more incredible than any human, especially after he took the second trial. He was in his armor, and a pair of sword hilts protruded from his back. His head was as bald as Letho's, and his terrifying heterochromatic eyes scared the villagers. Roy, please, stand back, let me try. Ixina put her hands before her belly, her fingers intertwined. She turned her gaze to Cohen and Keldar, an unspoken plea filling her eyes. Calm down. I'll explain everything. Don't attack them. The witchers exchanged a look and kept their silence. I need no explanation. Now get back here, you idiot girl, Raid beckoned her. No, Raid. Ixina's eyes welled with tears, her fingers fidgeting around like little twigs. With a voice as rough as a stony path, she shouted, You'd rather believe two criminals over your own daughter? Well, I know they won't kidnap my girl. Raid looked at the witchers warily. Now come with me. The chickens need feeding and the greens need pickling. No, no longer am I the girl you can lord around. Ixina wiped her tears and tugged at Cohen's hand. She raised her head and gave him one last smile. Then she turned around. I, Ixina, daughter of Raid, hereby announce my departure from the charcoal borg. No longer do I belong to you, any of you. I wish to be with Cohen forever. If you think of me as your family, then bless us. Bless us and leave this place. Raid pointed a gnarly finger at his daughter, his chest heaving violently. He was hissing like a serpent, but not a word escaped his lips. Don't waste your time, Raid. She's lost it. We're going in. A few of the burly miners shouted. Yeah, show those mutants no mercy. They try anything funny, and it's a one-way trip to hell. I'd like to see you try. Cohn took a step forward. Veins popped on his face, and he shouted loudly, It is Ixena's wish to stay and her wish takes precedence over yours. No one can make her do what she doesn't want to. Try, and I'll give you a taste of your own medicine. He flicked his wrist, and a yellow spark at bat, eared in his hand, flitting around his fingers like magic. The villagers gulped and took a few steps back. All their bravado was lost, and Raid looked like a defeated chicken. Witchcraft! Henry and Cud shouted. That's what's controlling Ixena. Charge! Bring judgment down on that sorcerer! Nobody moved. Not even Raid. Let's bring this to the Baron. He'll subject them to the stake. Another fearful voice shouted. Ah, I see you're a sensible one. To enlist the Baron's help and not opting for violence is wise, Keldar Siad. He was still standing under the overhang, his voice oddly calming. But do not forget where we are. This is Povis, a free kingdom made up of immigrants. We do not have pesky rules and tradition, unlike most kingdoms. All the villagers heard him and they put their weapons down. Cohen is right. Her decision trumps your will. Ixina is already of age. She has the right to decide what she wants to do. Not even her family, her father, or even her mother has the right to change her decision. Keldar shook his head, a smirk curling his lips. You may bring this to the Baron, but not even he has the right to impose his will on an adult woman. Not even if he brings it to the court of Lan Exeter. Raid was huffing and puffing, sweat pouring from his face. There was agony and frustration in his eyes. He might have the guts to cross the witchers, but he would never cross the nobility. His daughter took the side of the witchers. If they were to enlist the Baron's help, they might only gain mockery and punishment in return. Do not be afraid, people. The man with a red face turned redder. He looked like an apple now. This is nothing but witchcraft. They have Exena under their control. This is not what she really... Something tore through the air, cutting the shouts of Henry and Cud short. They were sent flying backward as if a sledgehammer had just hit them. Eventually, they slammed into the stone walls and fell with a thud. And then everyone noticed the holes in their foreheads. Crimson blood, crushed bones and brain matter drenched the earth. Their faces destroyed. It was a horrible death. They died without their heads. They're dead! The mutants killed them! Someone shouted and the villagers scrambled back the way they came. Roy tucked Gabriel away. 
Cohen was still holding Exena's hand, though he was frozen. Exena covered her mouth with one hand, while Keldar sighed. He darted ahead like a lightning bolt, casting multiple signs at the escaping people at the same time. His forearms spun and his fingers weaved. Signs blossomed from the buds of flesh, and a roar once again graced the yard, a great, stormy, powerful roar. Powerful winds blew across the people, and they froze. They stiffened up like puppets. Their eyes rolled back in their heads. Keldar stood in the center of the crowd, and he commanded, Return home and sleep. You shall forget all that has happened over the last three days, including today. The villagers trembled. They hung their heads low and left the mountain, their faces as blank as lifeless puppets. The sun shone upon Keldar, and he slowly turned around. The shock and confusion in Cohen and Ixena's eyes did not escape him, and so did Roy's realization. They were all looking at Keldar's face and the back of his hands, or, to be precise, the rotting part of it. The shadows beneath him did not escape their notice either, or, to be exact, the lack of shadows beneath him failed to escape their notice. Chapter 402 The Hidden Truth The villagers returned to their homes eventually, and peace came back to the fortress. Golden rays shone upon the yard, but they failed to wash away the loneliness Keldar felt. The Grand Master put his hands behind his back, his eyes fixated on Roy. He was inscrutable, but there was a hint of admonishment in his eyes. Taking their lives was unnecessary, Roy. That was impetuous of you. Keldar spoke before anyone could ask. I showed them mercy, time and time again. Roy shook his head. He argued, I let them live, and yet they saw my act of mercy as a sign of weakness. They were insulting our integrity and the innocence of a woman. With the pull of a trigger, I ended their lives without causing any pain. I call that mercy. Roy's eyes shone with respect. But the strength of your axie was astounding. I never thought it could hypnotize a group of people at the same time, and without eye contact as well. Is that the true power of roar and wing flap? Power is not something to be abused, lad. You should not have used them to harm humans. I disagree. Roy stared into Keldar's eyes. He argued, You call them humans, and yet they have crossed the line no human should. What makes them different from a monster then? And witchers kill monsters. Their operation was doomed to fail from the beginning. What they were doing was a fruitless struggle. There was no need to take extreme measures. Keldar shook his head in disappointment. Apparently, your goals differ from our school's values. Roy's cheeks twitched. He got brainwashed by his school's values. I might be the knight of a lady of the lake, but not even I am that stubborn. It was understandable to not kill innocents, but not when humans were threatening the witchers' very lives. That'd be a waste of power. Power would be nothing but mere decoration if not used. Roy did not budge a single inch, but he was obviously stiffening up. Cohen took a deep breath. There was hesitation in his eyes, and yet he spoke. He spoke with respect, but a bigger part of it was concern. Keldar, what happened back there? Why? Why do you not have a shadow? A gust of cold wind blew from the seas, climbing up the cliff and billowing Keldar's hair, almost blowing him off the ground. What happened to your hands and face? Cohen couldn't shake the earlier memory off. He wondered why Keldar's cheeks and hand paled and started to rot while he was chasing down the villagers. Even now, he could still see signs of the rot. Are you hurt or cursed? Ixena held Cohen's arm tightly. She too saw what happened. At first she was delighted, delighted that Keldar settled a nigh-unsolvable problem effortlessly. But then that delight was replaced by fear. I will tell you in due time, Keldar said slowly, but now is not that time. Excuses. Keldar, even now, you still wish to deceive your own student? Roy shook his head. You will never tell him the truth. Roy was starting to sort out everything he saw over the last couple of days. Keldar and Vesemir were born in the same era. Vesemir was already 300 years old, but oddly enough, Keldar was more than a hundred years younger than him. A hundred years ago, the avalanche almost killed every single griffin. Keldar has no shadow, and his body is rotting. Roy had a vague guess about what the truth really was, but he needed more information. Look in the mirror, Keldar. I've seen that look before, Roy said. Letho made that kind of face right before he charged into imminent death. He turned to Cohen. The younger griffin was tense, his fists bald, and yet Keldar did not speak. 
you wish to face this crisis alone, keeping it a secret from your own student. Roy stared at Keldar's old, pale face. But are you sure you can face this all by yourself? I thought you'd be more honest at your age, so why can't you tell us about your woes? Cohen can help, and I can chip in too. Roy genuinely said, I might be a newbie. My capabilities might be limited for the plans I have in mind, but I do not fight alone. I am not alone. He put an emphasis on the last part. I have the backing of eleven witchers and a mage. I disagree with how you conduct yourself, but that doesn't mean I deny your whole outlook on life. I too am a witcher. Say the word and I will help you, Roy emphasized. You can even treat this as a request if you don't want me to help for free. Just pay me however much you like. Keldar was having an internal struggle. Under the sun he stood. A long, long time later, he heaved a sigh, his eyes speaking of resignation and sorrow. Come in, then. They entered Keldar's abode and sat around the table. A seal covered up the basement's entrance, and light from the sconces shone on Keldar's face. With a hoarse and sorrowful voice, he told a story. A story regarding the great avalanche that befell Ker Saren. It was a story Cohen had told him, but the one Keldar spoke of was a different version. And Keldar's version painted an even darker history. A hundred years ago, mages who eyed the secrets hidden within these walls launched an ambush on us, saying they were allies of justice who came to vanquish the evildoers. They sent an avalanche crashing down on us, burying the fortress and all witchers in it. But you lived, Cohen interjected nervously. Keldar looked at his student. There was a small smile on his lips, but yet he dashed his student's hopes mercilessly. No, I too perished in that tragedy. Impossible. This cannot be true. For forty years I've lived with you, and you're no different from a regular human. Cohen shot up in disbelief. He held Keldar's hand and felt the warmth of life coming from him. You're still alive! Ixena held his hand. She didn't want to do this, but she shook her head. A bitter smile hung on Keldar's lips. I too thought I was alive. I thought I was fortunate enough to survive. That the avalanche failed to bury the lowest room. Through the snow I clawed, through the cold, dead bodies of my brethren I clawed, and eventually I reached the surface. His voice started to break and his eyes glossed over. But the snow was not what I broke out of. What I broke out of was a grave. Sixty-six gravestones stood around me, and one of them had my name carved on it. Cohn plopped back down like a discouraged little lion, his face blank. Roy kept his silence, but his eyes were as wide as almonds. This did not come as too much of a surprise for him. So that's why he's about a hundred years younger than Vesemir, even though they were born in the same era. Roy imagined how Keldar must feel when the first thing he saw after he came back out were the graves of him and his fallen brethren, and he could just imagine how despairing it must feel to see his home buried in snow. Which begs the question. Who or what kept Keldar alive for a hundred years? I apologize for the lies, Cohen. Apologetically, Keldar said, Erland is a true knight, a knight who upholds the values taught to us. He was the only one who survived the avalanche, given that he was stargazing. Our corpses were retrieved and buried in the mountains. Erland promptly left after that final deed. I do not fault him for his actions. He had faith in humanity. He had faith that his efforts would change how the world viewed witchers. Alas, he failed, and his faith crumbled and his brethren died along with the death of his faith. Left with nothing to hope for, Erland left the fortress. Roy heaved a sigh. His opinion on Erland changed a slight bit. He watched his life's work destroyed and his brethren killed in one fell swoop. His faith was crushed, and he was left with nothing to live for. Keldar stared at the crackling flames in the fireplace, his eyes glinting with reminiscence and gratitude. Before Erland departed, he left a letter that detailed his life's experience, and his personal notebook, titled The Hunt. He buried all the experiences and knowledge he had gained in my grave, and his notebook changed everything. Softly, Keldar said, it was a series of coincidental events. I can't explain why it happened, but the notebook underwent a change. This land, the avalanche, the grudge held by the souls of all who perished in the tragedy, something affected the change. Keldar looked at the locked door. There was love and hate in his eyes. It gave the notebook life and magic, strange magic, and the book, it chose me. It freed me from death. Hold it. Roy massaged his temples. 
Are you sure you were saved by a book? Sure it wasn't something else? Keldar nodded. Ixana's eyelid twitched. This sounds like a horror story. Cohen's shook his head in disbelief. You mean the same notebook I read revived you? The one where I learned everything I know? To be precise, the book's cover had to solve Mork written on it. In elder speech, it means Book of Shadows, Keldar answered. A pact was made between us, and a bond was formed. With the powers of this land, it revived me. At first, everything was normal. There was a hint of delight in Keldar's voice. And I thought I gained a magical item all for myself. Book of Shadows possesses an incredible ability. It can record all the knowledge in my mind without the need of any ink or quill, including the knowledge in the books I'm still reading and all my life experiences. The book has an endless supply of pages. For every full page, another blank one takes its place. It's more efficient than any spell mages can come up with. The only reason for its existence is the pursuit of knowledge. Roy was awed. He smacked the struggling griffon and almost whistled. The item of every scholar's dream, Keldar nodded. And dream I did. I loved books more than swords. The Book of Shadows was made for me. Ah, so that's why the book chose him. A smile finally cracked Keldar's lips, but that smile lasted for only an instant. It was replaced by a look of depression. Foolishly, I thought the Book of Shadows was a gift of fate. I spent the first two years of my new life swimming in the ocean of knowledge, but I eventually set out for the wider world in pursuit of Erland. By instinct, I recorded even more knowledge within the pages of the book. Cohn's cheeks trembled, and he wanted to ask something. Keldar interrupted him. As you can see, Cohen, I had the ability to enter and exit the fortress as I pleased for more than eighty years. I could travel to the ends of the world and nothing would happen to my body. However, the Book of Shadows cannot depart the fortress. There exists a bond between it and the land. What if you take it with you anyway? Roy asked. Then it shall disappear and return to this place. Keldar paused for a moment. I lived my life as most witchers did. On one of my journeys, I found myself passing through a Kovir village, and that was where I found you. Keldar stared at Cohen gently. His voice softened a little. You were only seven when I found you. Skin and bones, I'd say. Afflicted with smallpox and covered in pus. Your poverty-stricken parents abandoned you. I took you back to the fortress and nursed you back to health. I spent years raising you into a fine griffin. Cohn hissed loudly, tears welling in his eyes. Roy thought, Keldar saved him. Their bond is comparable to one tied by the law of surprise. Things remained the same until the 85th year. Keldar shook his head. It was then the side effects began to show. It mattered not how much the sun shone, my shadow remained hidden. I lost it. Forever. And I stayed out of the sun for fear of this phenomenon being noticed. And yet the tortures did not stop there. If I were to leave Kerseren, my body would begin to rot, my skin would start to peel, and my flesh would emit a foul stench. The longer I leave this land, the stronger the effects are. A smirk tugged on Keldar's lips. That proved to be a great dereliction. Should I ever want to leave the fortress, I have to don a thick cloak that is drenched in palm oil, dust, and grease, all to keep the stench of my rotting flesh in. If word got out, they would think I was a necrophage. And now there was resignation on Keldar's face. And yet that was not suffering enough for the book. The corruption began to eat into my mind. If I were to leave this place for more than ten minutes, I would lose all semblance of sanity and return to this fortress like a walking dead. Roy gasped. At first he thought the Book of Shadows was just a helping partner to Keldar, but now he knew the book was nothing but a slave master. I see. Cohen's face fell. Hoarsely, he said. For the last decade or so, I've always wondered why you've never left this place or basked under the sun. You would spend your days reading late into the night, either in your house, under the overhang, or beside the table. I see the reason now. Cohen punched the table. He seemed to blame himself for this. Most of the time, Cohen would be out hunting. Only during the winter would he return. He ignored all the odd habits Keldar exhibited, waving them away as some regular lifestyle. Cohen, you silly boy. Accountability is one thing, but being a scapegoat is another. This has nothing to do with you. Keldar patted his shoulder. This is what I chose. The book yearns for knowledge, as do I. I thought we would be perfect partners in this pursuit of knowledge. 
A heavy-hearted sigh escaped Keldar's lips, and he took a book out of the shelf. But after last night's unhappy event, I see now that it was just wishful thinking on my part. That book thinks of me as a mere tool to access more knowledge. He fell silent and opened the book, and tools eventually fail. Roy looked at the tensed-up Cohen. Exactly. It did not attack Roy for nothing. The book was choosing its next tool. Keldar stared at the young witcher. You have ambition, lad, and something inside you piqued the book's interest. Not even Vesemir managed to rouse its excitement. It didn't choose my student. Instead, it laid its eyes on you. It wishes to defeat you all so it can take over your body and create another tool for its insatiable longing. But the sun is its enemy, and so night is its battlefield. Its first attack failed, but the book will not stop at one attempt. Shock flashed within Roy's eyes. The book knows I'm different, and it wishes to enslave me? How laughable. But Keldar, how did it manage to command the dead griffins? Why? It shouldn't have that kind of power. Ah, it is all thanks to Roy that I found this. I should have realized this matter sooner. The Book of Shadows details all the life experiences of the griffins. Flames flared in Keldar's eyes. Those who perished in the avalanche are imprisoned within the pages of the book. It absorbs their knowledge and memories like a greedy, insatiable glutton for knowledge. And from now on, I declare the Book of Shadows my enemy. Keldar looked at the sealed basement. There was gratitude in his eyes, but there was also hatred. I must find a way to vanquish the book and release my suffering brethren from its grasp. Chapter 403, Phylactery Can't you just destroy it? Ixena asked carefully. Burn it with fire, or, or cut it up into pieces. It may be an odd book, but it is still just one book. It is not as simple as you think, Keldar answered calmly. The Book of Shadows shares a bond with the very land we step on. Its rich mana keeps the book safe at all times. Regular methods do not work on it. Warily, Keldar said, I tried Igni, Ard, and even burned it in the fireplace the whole night. It did not work. It's no metal, but the book is stronger than diamond and possesses more flexibility and heat tolerance than draconid leather. The four of them did not look happy to hear the news. Roy, since you wish to help, why don't you ask your Brotherhood's mage what she thinks of this? Perhaps she may have a way to dispel this curse. Keldar stared into Roy's eyes. Of course, I won't ask you to help for nothing. Once we release my brethren from their prison, you will have the privilege to research our secret arts. You and you only. Roy was about to say something, but Cohen clenched his fists and interrupted. Sir, what happens to you if we destroy the book? He was worried. Keldar only lived because of the book. If it were to be destroyed, then death would reclaim him. Do not be pessimistic, Cohen. Keldar suddenly patted Cohen's head. Death comes for us all. That is the law of nature. I should have died a hundred years ago, and yet I cheated death. He smiled. I've lived my life for no one but myself. In care Saren, I stayed. In care Saren, I hid. I lived the simple life of a scholar, and I raised you. No. Cohen shook his head. He was reluctant to go on with the plan, and he wished to change Keldar's mind. Perhaps they're not tormented. Perhaps they're used to the book. It is possible that they do not wish for release. Cohen's eyes went red, and he shouted, We should keep things as it is. Cohen. Cohen froze, but this time he refused to budge. He stared straight into Keldar's eyes. Why do you not understand, Cohen? I've lived for far too long, more than what I desire. He sighed. Yes, this extension of life is a dream come true, but extend it long enough, and any dream would inevitably become a nightmare. Be it a dream or nightmare, we must wake from our sleep. But with nightmares, you wake with a scream. It was the truth, and it hurt. I've woken, and screamed I have. No longer can I turn a blind eye to my brethren's suffering, not even in the pursuit of knowledge, and my life as a tool is fast coming to an end. Change must happen. I have one wish remaining. Do you want to deny me that? Cohen buried his face in his hands, his mind reeling in shock. Ixina huddled closely to him, her eyes tearing up. Roy. Roy sighed. He had conflicting emotions regarding the matter. Mah. It was not every day he came across someone who wished for death, and yet he would not want to refuse. I am more than happy to help, but I have a question. Once the Griffins leave the book, they will not be allowed to remain in the material world. Their souls will soon vanish, and only the void awaits. Are you sure this is a good idea? Keldar shook his head. 
he asked. Roy, if you were in their place, would you rather live on as an entity imprisoned in a book that is your master? Or would you sacrifice your life if it meant you could be free of the chains that bound you and step into the real world, even for just a moment? Roy froze. He had no answer to that. No griffin would prefer a caged life. I am the only one who's different. I know my brethren. To them, their homes will always be the skies, the wilderness, and the mountains. Not a cage, no. A long, long silence later, Roy licked his lips and turned his gaze to the basement. And then he looked outside the window. The sun was still shining bright upon the ground. Keldar, first we must see that tome. The sun is still shining. I reckon it can't do any harm just yet. The stony walls of the mountains gleamed gold, white snow shimmering on the ground. But one speck of darkness Roe ned the purity of the snow. One black tome with golden highlights sat in the center of the ground. The tome was at least three times larger than most books and had the thickness of a balled-up fist. Upon the dark cover, the words du sauve mork were emblazoned. In elder speech, it meant Book of Shadows. Dark mist as viscous as honey overflowed from the cover surrounding it and keeping it out of the gleaming sunlight. Two witchers in armor made of brigandine and chains stood around the book. Accompanying them were Roy and Ixena. Book of Shadows. Type. Components. Leather. Mana. Souls. Knowledge. This book contains all of the Griffin School's secrets. The magic of this land has granted it a soul. Roy grabbed his vibrating medallion. Keldar, does it understand our tongue? This book has been given life. It would take a human ten lifetimes to learn all the knowledge within it but it grows differently than us. Keldar had conflicting emotions about the book. Despite being a 100-year-old entity, its intelligence remains at an elementary stage. He made a detailed description. Its behavior is governed by what I suppose is a system akin to instinct within feral beasts, and its instinct only has four goals, the pursuit of truth, the protection of this land, the search for its next tool, and self-preservation. If anyone can cause enough damage to it, that is. It does not do much aside from the aforementioned actions. It has chosen me as the next tool. Are you sure it won't summon a soul to attack me out of the blue? Roy was still worried. You may touch it, but do not open the book. Roy touched the cover with his index finger, then his thumb, and then his whole hand. Unlike how its exterior would suggest, the book felt different to the touch. It was warm and smooth, not unlike a warm breeze that just kissed Roy's skin. A feeling of comfort welled up within him, and a voice spoke within his heart. It was silvery, but there was an urgency in it. Open my pages. Read me. Record. Roy let the book go without hesitation. That level of temptation was nothing before his iron will. Cone and Exena touched the book as well, and they let go easily. Did you hear a voice when you touched it? What voice? Exena stared at Cone in confusion and her lover shook his head as well. Definitely odd. Roy nodded. The book is only trying to entice me. What are you trying to gain, book? I shall prepare a magical circle to weaken its contact with the chaos energy lingering in the air. Keldar started delegating duties. Cohen, retrieve my specter dust and my collection of potions and decoctions. A difficult battle awaits. Cohen froze. Go! Now! Keldar kicked Cohen's arse, and the younger witcher shuffled into the lab. The Grand Master shook his head and turned his attention to Roy. You should contact the mage, or would you like me to open a portal? There is no need for that. I have a telescope. Coral should be doing her experiments at this hour. However, the entities in that book will prove to be a great threat once this ritual is underway. I'll get some of the members here to help us out. Stubbornly, Keldar shook his head. I cannot afford the services of so many witchers. This battle is an affair of our school, and with the sun on our side, we alone shall suffice. The telescope's crystal rendered a rainbow out of the sunlight that shone upon it. A slender, powerful hand rubbed the crystal three times, and his mana dropped by fifty points. Blinding light shone from the crystal, congregating in the air. Ripples spread across the screen at first, but it eventually refocused. A beautiful silhouette in a red dress stood before a boiling cauldron. Magical lights flowed from her hands as she weaved the spells needed for her experiments. Her fiery hair danced across her shoulders, and dried herbs flew from atop the shelves into the cauldron, causing little splashes. She noticed Roy's summon, 
and the mage turned around. Her eyes were filled with surprise, and a big smile curled her beautiful Lars, Ed Lips. Slowly, she approached the telescope, but what she saw made her cover her mouth in surprise. What happened to your hair, Roy? Um, Keldar taught me some new tricks. I went and cast it before I managed to master it, and it burned my hair off. But don't worry, it'll grow back soon enough. The sorceress clutched her belly, a string of giggles and laughter escaping her lips. At the same time, she made a gesture with her left hand. I need to take this down. A blinding flash covered the screen and Roy's face fell. Oh gods, why do I have to go through this? My dear Coral, this is an emergency. You can laugh after you help me out. A second, please. Coral raised her head abruptly and tried her best not to smile. She sighed at the mirror, anticipation glowing in her eyes. Say that again? I need your help. No, before that. My dear Coral. Good. I'll let this disfigurement slide. Happily, she nodded. A hue of red flooded her cheeks. I'll help you just this once. Roy finished the story in half an hour, and Lydda was rubbing her cheeks, deep in her thoughts. That item is sentient, has control over spiritual entities, is able to devour shadows, and shares a bond with a place of power. I almost can't believe it's a book. It almost sounds like a phylactery. It's something necromancers use. It's a phylactery? So it's man-made? Roy's heart sank. Is it possible it came into creation because of the overlap of a few unfortunate circumstances? I would not rule out that possibility. This is a big world, and anything is possible, especially when it comes to magic. There are mysteries we would find almost impossible to crack. Roy heaved a sigh of relief, but he remained vigilant. Lydda crossed her arms and leaned over. Regular methods will not work on a phylactery if destruction is what you seek. You must attack its core. Its core? Roy stared at Lydda's bosom. Once upon a time, he spent one week just playing with Coral's chest. Its soul. You need to conjure a spell that can destroy its soul. It's the only way to kill the phylactery and give its prisoners a final release. But be warned, phylacteries can and will retaliate fiercely. Do you know any spell that can be useful against it? Roy stared into Coral's eyes nervously. Regrettably, Lydda shook her head. This is necromancy. A long, long time ago, the Brotherhood forbade the practice of necromancy and demonic summoning. Most of their archives are destroyed. I cannot help you, and no friends of mine know much about necromancy. This is obviously beyond you, Roy. Don't attempt this. Lydda spoke sternly, but the concern in her voice was unmistakable. I know. I won't do it. That's all for now. I'll come back soon. Roy nodded, but then he imagined how he would go about this. Hmm. Fear can devour demons. If I'm right, this core is also a soul like those demons. Wonder if fear can work. Roy was about to turn the telescope off, but Lydda shot him a nasty glare and her face was black as thunder. Hey, aren't you forgetting something? Ma. Goodbye, Coral. Hmph. Roy shook his head and placed his chipmunk in a corner. He scratched its chin, telling it to hide, and then he left the room. Back in the courtyard, Keldar had already drawn out a magic circle made of specter dust, infused dust, and other components. The circle was divided into two parts. The outer part was further broken down into four parts, each having the basic elements written down in elder speech. The inner circle was filled with words like isolation, seal, and mana exclusion. Roy could feel the mana within him running slower just by standing close to the circle. Within the center of the circle sat the Book of Shadows, its magical light confined within itself. The circle and sun managed to cut off its mana supply, even when it was lying on its place of power. No longer did it shine like it used to. It was as dull as most tomes now. I have an idea, Roy told the Griffins about Lydda's suggestion. She might not have the power to solve this matter, but Roy possess had something she didn't, the spell Fear. I will launch an attack at the tome every two minutes. You guys are on the defensive. If the tome deems me a threat, it most possibly will attack me with its soldiers. I leave them in your hands. Roy wasn't sure if reincarnation worked in this realm, but if he were to be the one who landed the kill, all those souls would be annihilated, and he would never want to annihilate a griffin's soul. Cohen wanted to say something, but he held his tongue. Keldar shook his head. Focus, Cohen. Remember the lessons I taught you. A difficult battle lies in wait for us. If you are distracted, it would mean the death of your comrade. That is not the way of the griffin. I understand, sir. 
Cohen hung his head low and balled his fists. After much persuasion, Ixena left with a reluctant heart and hid in the mountains, leaving the witchers free to surround the book. They stood in a triangle, and Keldar distributed the potions and decoctions. Everyone had a juiced-up Petri's filter to increase their sign intensity, a powered-up full moon to level up their constitution, and an echidna's decoction to heal them every time they spent any mana. As they would avoid killing the spiritual entities, the battle would be a defensive one. Roy gulped down all the decoctions. Their sickly sweetness, bitter taste, and spicy kick exploded in his belly, and a surge of warmth coursed through his limbs. Black veins crawled across the witcher's chins and cheeks. They stood around the circle, exchanging glances before the battle. Keldar suddenly let out a laugh, the breeze billowing his hair and beard. Do it, Roy. I'll watch your back. In the name of my school, I swear I shall protect you, even if the price is my life. I swear, Cohen shouted as well, his face red with fury. Roy nodded and covered himself with the shields of Heliotrop and Quen. Then, his attention was finally turned to the tome. Chapter 404 The End Once more, Roy cast fear, but this time, something was different. The young witcher had splashed the pure white snow with crimson liquid. Multiple tentacles came forth from the ground, wrapping the book and holding it up into the air. The tentacles swayed, their suckers expanding and contracting. Blood and sulfur flowed from them, corroding the book. Smoke billowed from it, and Roy was shocked. Fear used to be an attack that purely targeted souls and minds. Touching their target was out of the question, and yet the tentacles could attack physically now. So this is what it means by altering reality. Not an exact alteration like a certain powerful stone, but I get the picture. Keldar and Cohen were staring at the wriggling tentacles, their eyes burning crimson. They might not be the primary target, but still they witnessed the tentacles, and suffice to say, these things did not look righteous or kind at all. On the contrary, they looked evil and threatening. Keldar shot Roy a look of suspicion, but it was too late for regrets. A shout, akin to the cry of an infant, tore through the air. Magic ripples spread across the air around the book trapped within the cage of tentacles. Invisible shockwaves hurtled across the snowy land, stirring up a wave of snow and revealing the holes underneath. Stones and twigs were blown away, and the witchers got out of the attack's way. Three seconds later, the book was free of its prison. As it fell back down into the circle, a black light shone from the book, into a silhouette it became, and twin swords were strapped to its back. It raised its head, but there was no face to speak of, and yet the bloodlust coming from it was unmistakable. It was directed at Roy. The silhouette made a sign with both hands, and a bright crimson rune shone. A surge of terrifying heat descended upon them, covering Roy. The young witcher's face fell. Again? I don't have another full recovery to help me out this time. But before the attack could hit, something else roared, and Roy thought he saw a huge, impregnable mountain erecting itself over him. Keldar crossed his arms and made a heliotrop sign at a blinding speed, and a black triangle shone. The Grandmaster raised his right hand, not unlike someone opening an umbrella to keep themselves out of the sun. A gleaming black dome shielded the witchers, and not a moment too soon. The pillar of flames had rained down upon them, but before heliotrop, the attack faded away into nothing. Keldar pulled his hands back and dispelled his sign. The veins on his face wriggled, and he coldly swung his arms. A charge of Ard flew toward the silhouette. The sign threw it off balance, and it fell back down like a clumsy tortoise. Roy suddenly had a feeling that the silhouette took the hit on purpose. Is it trying to resist the book? Does it have a mind of its own? Kelda then cast Yurden at the silhouette. Right when the silhouette got back up, invisible chains tied it up. Its arms were clasped closely to its ribs, while its legs closed tightly. Like a silly, unarmed creature, it tried to struggle free from its chains, and yet it couldn't even make any sign to attack. Reassured, Roy turned his attention to the tome. Fear seemed to have taken a toll on the book. There were obvious tentacle marks on the cover. A faceless head within the book was crying out in fear, but Roy spared it no mercy. He sneered. One minute remained until he could cast fear once more. But the battle was far from over. The book summoned more of its minions, and this time, it was three at once. The silhouettes leapt out at Roy. 
One of them unsheathed its blade while the others started casting their signs. Roy and Cohen shoved a couple of ords into the silhouettes, cutting their sign casting short. Keldar shot another Yurden at the silhouette that was unsheathing its blade, locking it in place. Cohen was fully in charge of defense. Roy played support, while Keldar kept on the offensive with Yurden. Their teamwork was running well, and the book's power had considerably of Thals, eakened thanks to the sunlight. Twenty seconds later, the roaring waves of battle came to a halt, and four silhouettes stood in the yard, restricted by invisible chains. Fear's cooldown was finished, and Roy sent his tentacles after the book once more. Once again, it was lifted into the air. An ear-piercing evil scream ripped through the air, and the black tendrils of smoke that surrounded the book turned into vapor. A white crack, the size of an index finger, unfurled across the cover. Roy had a feeling he was one, fear away from destroying the crux of the phylactery. The book knew that much as well, and it launched an all-out retaliation in the face of imminent doom. For the third time, the book summoned its minions, and this time, it released everything it had. Ten silhouettes appeared on the snowy ground. When they raised their eyes, the witchers thought they saw the silhouettes opening their eyes, even though the monsters had no eyes to speak of. Shocked, Roy quickly cast Quen and Heliotrop over himself, while Cohen stood in front of him, his arms crossed as he took a defensive stance. Once again, Keldar cast another Heliotrop, enclosing them in a dome. Terrifying roars shook the very air of the fortress, reverberating across the cliffs and mountains. The roars tore through the heavens, and magical light gleamed like twinkling stars. Roars of chaos energy hurtled across the battlefield, waves of flames and gales soaring across the air, engulfing Keldar's shield. For a moment, Roy thought he was witnessing the endless seas crashing down on Keldar's indomitable mountain. And the mountain lost. Keldar managed to let out a grunt before an invisible hand clutched him and tossed him far, far away. The Grandmaster fell with a sickening thud, blood spewing from his mouth. And yet he was determined to get back up and charge straight at the silhouettes. The gales blew Cohen off his feet, and he tumbled backward into the snow. Roy, who was well protected, suffered the least. All he felt was himself swaying. But the assault wasn't over. Five of the silhouettes unsheathed their blades and came at Roy from all directions, while the rest kept casting signs. Lights filled the air, heralding the coming of another wave of magic. Roy decided he would not wait anymore. He sent one of the silhouettes flying away with Ard and produced Gabriel with his right hand. A flying bolt crushed the ankle of one of the silhouettes, while Cohen made his appearance from behind. He pushed both hands forward, enclosing him and Roy with the golden shield of Quen. The blades failed to land, and the attackers were deflected. A hint of agony flashed on Cohen's face. Blood trickled down his lips, and yet the resolve in his eyes never wavered. Once again, he started casting another sign. At the same time, the silhouettes that were casting signs came face to face with Keldar. They assailed the Grandmaster with waves of flames and winds, while Keldar defended himself with the black shield of Heliotrop. For a moment there, Heliotrop was holding its own against the wave of magical attacks, but then the side effects of roar overuse surfaced. Blood poured forth from Keldar's face, but still he did not waver. Before his erstwhile comrades he stood, with courage in his heart. Two battles were raging in the courtyard. On one hand, Roy and Cohen were dealing with the sword-wielding silhouettes. Magic was severely weakened on the edges of the circle. Back to back they stood, their swords swiftly arsing across the air, and bolts would fly from time to time. Silhouettes circled them like a black tornado, trying to cut the witchers down. Their blades gleamed like a thousand shooting stars, but fortunately, the sun weakened their battle prowess. An Arendite suppression was starting to take effect. Once again, crimson tentacles appeared from the void, appearing in the material world thanks to Roy's iron will. They attacked alongside Arendite, ignoring the silhouette's defenses. Every time they attacked, the silhouettes would be stunned for a split second, taking away some heat from Roy and Cohen. Still, their impeccable teamwork was no match for the group of veteran witchers, even if those witchers were nothing but spiritual entities. In just one minute, the snow around them was drenched in red, and so were the young witchers' bodies. 
A deep gash tore a strip of flesh on Roy's shoulder and chest, while Cohen's sides were cut, revealing a bloody gash. Those were the bigger injuries. They had sustained multiple minor injuries as well. And yet the young witchers had it better. Keldar's hair and beard were charred, his face was bruised, and his arms and neck were covered in burns, bruises, and gashes. If it weren't for Full Moon and Echidna's decoction, he would have fallen in battle a while ago. Keldard gnashed his teeth, huffing and puffing like a bull. His eyes were as wide as saucepans, and he was trying to discern who the silhouettes were supposed to be. One of the monsters stopped casting its sign. It unsheathed its blade and pounced at Keldar, swinging its weapon down at the Grandmaster's shoulder. With a trembling hand, Keldar sent it flying back with Quen, but another silhouette shoved an ard at the Grandmaster. He tried to cast another sign, but he had lost his speed. The air itself exploded around him, and he fell forward, his head dizzy. Before he fell to the ground, Keldar felt something whizzing over his head, and he rolled away. Alas, it was too late. When he realized what was happening, he found his neck coming face to face with the edge of a black blade. It grazed him, drawing blood, and yet the blade did not advance. All of a sudden, the blade began trembling. Despite the lack of a face, the silhouette managed to convey the feeling of agony, and it wasn't the only monster feeling that way. Its companions had stopped their attacks. They were all spasming like humans having an episode of fits. The black smoke that surrounded them melted away like snow under the sun. It rose into the air, turning into vapor. Arcs of electricity danced across their bodies, and Keldar looked around. He saw at least fifty silhouettes dotting the mountains, and standing before them was his student. Cohen was holding himself up with a sword, while Roy held the Book of Shadows high in the air. No longer did the book possess the light of magic, and the young witchers smiled. Your efforts have borne fruit. You have devoured the core of the Book of Shadows, EXP 600. See, we did it. You're fine, Keldar. A long sigh of relief escaped Cohen's lips. He clutched his sides with one hand and dragged himself over to Keldar with his sword as a crutch. You're still alive! A toothy grin curled his lips, and tears welled in his eyes. He looked like a child who just won in a race. It was the best outcome he could hope for. The Griffins were freed from their prison, and his mentor survived. But before he could reach Keldar, things started to change. The black tendrils of smoke that haunted the silhouettes were no more. In their place were blue, translucent souls. Eventually, those souls became entities that possessed faces. They stood before the fortress, standing under the sun like knights. The souls were burly, their eyes wild, and twin swords were strapped to their backs. With delight, they looked at themselves. Some even started touching their cheeks. And then laughter ensued. Loud, hearty laughter that flowed across the seas and mountains. All the souls went past Cohen, huddling beside Keldar. There was approval and gratitude in their eyes. With delight in their voices, they spoke. You saved us, old sport. Nicely done. Grindstone, you're the smartest out of us. I knew you could do it. Finally, I thought I was going to be imprisoned forever. You did it, Keldar. I love the taste of fresh air, brothers. Despite how bruised Keldar was, he managed to crack a smile. He was shivering in delight, and he shook their hands, hugging them. Laughter filled the ruins of Kaer Saren as long-lost brothers were reunited. Roy stood beside Cohen, the Book of Shadows, in his hand. He watched the scene unfurl, keeping his silence. It has been a hundred years. Things have changed, brothers. They changed a lot. I'll show you around. Keldar led them to the dilapidated houses among the ruins. Ah, we might be imprisoned in the book, but we know what happened. You kept the place running for a hundred years, and you got yourself a student. The spirits gave Cohen looks of encouragement, and Cohen held his head high like a soldier getting evaluated by his superiors. The spirits walked from one house to another, their laughter filling the air. Keldar thought he was transported back a hundred years when witchers were at their peak. Every winter, the griffins would gather around a bonfire in the Great Hall, sharing their adventures and triumphs. They would spar, sing, and drink the nights away. For a moment, Keldar thought he saw the fortress in all its glory, and he felt like he could fly. Come in, sit, I'll make stew for you. Sorry, old sport, but we don't have time for that. 
one burly man with an exquisite mustache patted Keldar's shoulder. With a smile, he said, we're departing soon. The group of spirits held one another's shoulders, forming a chain of spirits. All of them stared at the fog-covered mountains, and one by one they started to fade away. Keldar saw his old friends off, and sobs escaped his lips. Someone began to sing a song, a song about their school. The griffins began to chime in. Their singing rang in the air, the crashing waves providing some background sound. Their song filled the air of the fortress, fluttering ever so slowly to the skies that lingered above, flowing down into the ocean that crashed beneath them. They sang and sang, until eventually, their spirits popped like bubbles. Shards remained, but eventually those shards were gone with the wind as well. Keldar sat before the ruined walls. He patted his knees, still humming the song under his breath. Eventually he stopped. Come, Cohen. He waved at Cohen. The young griffin approached his mentor, but what he saw made him cry. Keldar's flesh was starting to rot, his face bulging and wasting away. Do not cry, lad. Hold it well. Roy approached Keldar as well, and he gave the Grandmaster the book. Keldar held Cohen's hand as tightly as he could. When blood was starting to trickle from his skin, he handed the book to his student. Tears of blood trickled down what remained of Keldar's cheeks. There was reluctance and worry in his eyes and there was also the look of sweet relief hiding in them. Find yourself a student and teach him the values of our school. Be smart. Don't just say yes to anything. Understand, answer me. Yes, sir, Cohn shouted as hard as he could, his hands holding on to the bones of his mentor. Keldar only had his right eye left, and he looked at the courtyard one last time. For a moment, he saw through time itself, where a witcher with a Moican hairstyle and a tattoo of an eagle hanging on his neck holding the hand of a gaunt boy with grayish-brown hair. They were venturing on a long, dark, and narrow path. The journey was difficult, and yet they traveled. The man noticed Keldar's stare, and he looked back. Their eyes met, and the man smiled. He nodded at Keldar. The sunset was gorgeous, but it failed to wash away the sorrow in the ruins. It shone down on the skeletal remains of Keldar. The dying Grandmaster looked up in the sky and extended his hand to the man he saw. Erland. Try as he might, he couldn't cross through time. And then his hand froze, the ghost of his last smile hanging on for one single moment. His rotting body started to crumble like a corroded statue. First his fingertips, then his arm, and then nothing remained. Ashes flew into the air, and Cohen tried to hold him in his hands, but he failed. All he held was a handful of ash. Keldar. A scream tore through the air, and a quiet sigh followed. Chapter 405, News About Kasiga The sun was setting, painting the skies with a beautiful hue of crimson and gold before night took over. Lydda had gotten herself a luxurious room in Gildorf. Her sheets and blanket were made of swan feathers, and the veil around was made of dreamy purple silk. An oversized closet stood in the corner, and bottle after bottle of makeup products lined the dressing table. Lydda was in a white robe. Carefully, she applied mascara on her eyelashes, and then she painted her nails with purple nail polish. She pulled her hair together and smoothened the flyaways before she finally stood up and touched the crystal on the steel rack. Bright light filled the dark room, and beautiful motes of magical energy danced over the crystal, forming a screen of light. A vague silhouette appeared on the screen, and it was glinting. The projection was still unstable, but it did not take too long for the screen to focus. A lady with the face of a teen appeared on the screen. She was tall, blonde, and wearing a low-cut green dress. Her face was as beautiful and smooth as white jade. Only a perfect sculpture of a goddess or nymph could hope to compete with this level of beauty. Hello, Coral. Margarita Logsantil smiled at Lida. To what do I owe the pleasure? It's been a year since I last saw you. It's unbelievable that you have time for me, she jokingly grumbled. Did Karak's new king fall for you already? Lita shook her head. She was happy to see her friend again. Margarita, you know I'm no longer Karak's royal consultant. I will not stay in that minuscule kingdom. Its king does not know how to treat me. He can live out his fairy tale life with his jealous queen. This lady found a new job months ago. Is that so? Margarita rested her chin on the back of her hand. With a silvery voice of delight, she said, It must be a really great job if you gave up on your position as a consultant for it. Let me guess. 
you would like to further your ambition and serve Foltest alongside Marigold and Kira. A momentary pause followed, and the glint of anticipation gleamed in Margarita's eyes. Oh wait, are you coming back to Aratuza to teach? Lita shot up and showed her friend the ank that was hanging from her neck. A smile curled her lips. No, I'm a free mage now, I work for myself. I'm sorry, did I hear that right? A hint of shock flashed within Margarita's eyes. You're taking all the risks of running a business? Did you check your purse? Do you have enough money to sustain yourself? Won't it worry you if your reserves start to run dry? What if you don't have enough coins to get the latest dress or accessory? What if you can't even afford the new makeup? Margarita suggested, If you ask me, you should come back and work with me. We'll raise more generations of mages. I have five years' worth of reserves. Lita raised her head confidently. It's enough for two years of research, and that's why I'm calling you. I shall be conducting a secret experiment in isolation for the next two years, and I will cut off all contact in the meantime, including but not limited to the telescope and holograms. I shall not be attending the summit until 1264 at the very least. Don't complain. Two years is nothing for us. Disappointment filled Margarita's eyes, and she stretched her arms. You're still researching Witcher mutation? My dear, you should really reconsider your choice. This is a futile attempt. Witchers will be snuffed out of existence in the near future. This product has no market. Your efforts will be for nothing. It's a waste of time and money. Profit isn't the only reason we do research, and it shouldn't be. This is a passion project, so to speak. Lita stared outside the window, a sweet smile curling her lips. Oh, I know that look. Margarita let out a laugh, a hearty, beautiful laugh. Her foundation almost creased, and she scrunched her nose. Love is in the air. I can smell it on you, Lita. I see you're dating a witcher. I take it you're doing this research for him. Margarita huddled T, loser to the telescope. Tell me everything. No, let me guess. He's head over heels for you, fallen for your charms, has he? Lita said nothing, but a hue of crimson painted her cheeks. Ah, don't be shy, Lita. It's not wrong to seek pleasure. Margarita winked at her friend. Your choice of partner is unorthodox, but as long as they can pleasure us, it doesn't matter if they're a witcher. Coral finally nodded. Gently, she said, By day, we work on the research like a pair of professionals, but by night, he falls for my charms and tells me everything. You still don't believe me, Roy. Why did your body sparkle during the trial? And don't tell me that's magic, because I know what magic looks like. My dear Coral, this is a blessing. Just think of it that way. Can't you be more specific? What kind of blessing? Divine or bloodline? Um, it's hard to explain. I'm not knowledgeable enough to describe it to you, but I will contact you once the time is ripe, or you can just read my mind if you're so eager to know. But I can't read your mind. That's the problem. Lita pouted and broke that train of thought off. She continued. He loves me but I'm a little scared by how much vigor he possesses. Yes, young men should have more vigor, but he can be a bit too lively. Like a lion that never tires, he keeps asking for more. During the rare times he falls asleep, he cuddles me like I'm the embodiment of love for him. He has completely fallen for me, and he does everything I ask him to. Yeah, that's right. Get back here, Roy. It's not even dawn yet. Sorry, but we have plans. I need to travel to Puvis and look for Care Saren. I don't want you to leave. The trial just ended. You have to make up for lost time. But I made a promise. I can't go back on my word. You'd rather go all the way to a freezing land and convince a 300-year-old man into joining your brotherhood than give some time to your poor, lonely girlfriend? Get back here right now. Don't tell me you found a new girl. I love you, Coral. I do. I'll make breakfast for you. Oysters, eggs, and freshly caught crabs. How does that sound? Piss off to Povis. I envy you. The love in Coral's eyes did not escape Margarita. She felt a little jealous, but she was also happy for her friend. Fine, you can leave the Brotherhood and Aratuza to work for someone else. Enjoy your time with the Witcher. Margarita nodded. I'll tell Tasaya and the Brotherhood about your leave. Thank you. Lita heaved a sigh of relief. Good, I can stay away from the battle now. So where's your lab? That's a secret. Ah, I see you've built your love nest, Margarita said. What's next? A wedding? Hmm. Should I prepare any presents? 
Where there's a present, there's a return favor. Lita said, stay in the academy for the next couple of years. A friend of mine told me it's dangerous to be out and about, and I trust his judgment. I won't be stepping out of this place for the next decade anyway. Won't change a thing. Margarita held the obsidian talisman hanging on her neck. Oh, I almost forgot. The girl has been pestering me lately. She wants to see you. Sends in a request once every two weeks. It's been about a dozen times now. You mean Kasiga? Yes, the girl from Aldersburg, the one you sponsored. Do you want to see her? Margarita smiled. It's the day off. I can summon her here right away. You'll have ample time to talk. The smile was wiped off Lita's face and her eyes glinted. A moment later, Lita nodded nervously. The telescope shone once more, but this time it revealed a round, petite face behind it. The girl looked like she was in her mid-teens. Her skin was fair, and her looks were beautiful. Her brown hair was tied in a ponytail, her eyes brimming with innocence. Her nose and lips were dainty, and her cheeks were chubby. She looked adorable. The girl was delicate, a big red robe covering her body, not showing even an inch of skin. She was wearing a pair of pink shoes, and she looked like T, he little red riding hood. When she saw who was on the other side of the mirror, she clasped her hands before her chest, her eyes filled with surprise. Coral! Her voice was as silvery as the chirp of a bird. Dimples formed on her cheeks as she smiled, and happiness filled her eyes. You're finally here. Sorry, Kasiga. It's been a busy period for me. Coral looked at the girl's neck and shoulders. With concern, she asked, How is your recovery? Do the wounds still hurt? Not at all. Didn't even leave a scar. My skin is as smooth as silk. Even the calluses are gone. Kasiga stood straighter, her robe clinging closely to her chest. She spread her arms and spun around. There was a spring in her step. With tears of gratitude in her eyes, she said, This is all thanks to Aretuza and you, Coral. Good to hear. How's school? Does anyone bully you? No, everyone's been nice to me. Kasiga shook her head, a genuine smile curling her lips. She was not the only one who used to be disfigured. The same tragedy found its way into the early lives of many of her friends. They could understand each other. Still, that didn't mean conflicts didn't happen. Class discrimination existed everywhere, but compared to her old life, this was heaven. I made three friends, Alice, Rose, and Missy. They're my roommates. I see you're adapting to your new life. Your next step should be a change of attire. Get something fashionable. Also get some earrings, rings, and hats. Lita rested her chin on her hand. She stared at Kasiga from head to toe. The young lady felt anxiety welling within her. She held the hem of her robe, her cheeks reddening. See, Margarita, she will dress you up. It's a gift from me. Sorry I missed your birthday. Surprised, Kasiga shook her head. No, you've spent a lot on me. You bought me a contract of free education and paid for my tuition and necessities. I owe you too much. I can't begin to fathom how I should repay my debt. And this robe is beautiful. It's clean. I like it. This is compensation. I do not take no for an answer, Coral answered sternly. She made a padding gesture, and Kasiga bowed. At the same time, she tilted her head. Innocently, she asked, Why did you say it's compensation? You don't owe me anything. No, I said it was a gift. That's it. Speaking of which, how is your progress with magic? Kasiga counted her fingers and seriously answered, I've passed the tests for meditation, magic maneuver, and magic shield. She gained a nod of approval from Coral. Keep it up, Kasiga. Perhaps you can be my assistant someday. When you've mastered enough spells. Kasiga nodded seriously. Coral asked Kasiga to talk about her daily life before telling her she would cut off contact for two years. Kasiga was reluctant to see her go, but Coral wanted to cut the contact off right away. However, the girl stammered, Coral, um, do you have news about him? She stared at Lita's lips. There was anxiety and anticipation in her eyes. Her only worry was that Coral might say no. The smile on Lita's face froze. She pursed her lips and played dumb. Who are you talking about, Kasiga? Um, the apprentice witcher. Kasiga gritted her teeth and raised her voice. The brave knight who rescued me from my predicament, Roy, of the Viper School. A long silence ensued. Lita turned her back to the screen. Her teeth were clenched, and her eyes were filled with the flames of fury. But when she turned back to face Kasiga, she was wearing a beautiful smile again. Oh him? He's fine. Real fine, she answered curtly. 
Kasiga patted her chest and heaved a sigh of relief. She held her fists up, cheering herself up. Did he pass the trial? Do you know where he is right now? Ah, he's a real witcher now. Lita tried her best to sound calm. He's adventuring in lands afar, killing monsters. Kasiga, the trial's modification is on par with the ones we experienced, she said mysteriously. He looks different from what he used to be, taller and stronger than most humans, I'd say. And then she started exaggerating the tongue. Ings. He even lost his hair from the mutation. I have a picture of it if you want to see. Lita waved her hand, lights of magic dancing across her fingers. And then the image of a handsome, heterochromatic, bald man with a resigned look on his face appeared before the telescope. Huh? Kasiga's eyes went wide with confusion and shock. Her jaw dropped far enough to stick an egg in her mouth. She couldn't imagine Roy had changed this much in two years. He used to be gaunt and handsome. He was the one who gave her the precious Gwent card and showed her respect for the first time in her life. She couldn't imagine the boy who danced with her in the house of the wine cellar would turn into a bald young man, and the almost aggressive passion in his eyes was almost palpable. Kasiga curled up a little and patted her chest. No matter what he looks like, he's still Roy. But why does he look so miffed? He's ugly, isn't he? Kasiga's response was just what Coral wanted. That nervous look in her eyes especially. Good thing I caught this picture. Not exactly, Kasiga answered seriously. The initial shock had left her. He might be bald, but he's still better looking than most people. Still, he grows fast. He has muscles all over him now, and he's at least one head taller than I am. A frustrated Kasiga kicked the floorboard. Why didn't he come to Gore's Velen? It's been two years since he promised to see me. Kasiga twiddled her fingers and stared at Coral. She bowed and pleaded, Coral, can you ask him why he won't come to see me? He made that promise way back in Aldersburg. Oh, and I have a letter. Can you hand it to him? He made a promise to you? Cold fury glinted in Lita's eyes and her chest heaved. A long while later, she sighed. Fine, I'll give him the letter, but don't hold out for him. She shook her head. Roy's an unpredictable lad. He has a lot of plans. I can't guarantee him going to Aretuza, nor can I be certain that he will write a return letter, but at the very least, I'll send him your regards. Chapter 4 and 6 Settle Down Morning light rained upon the land, bringing with it glorious sunshine. The house of Gawain stood tall in the woods, the rustling of the leaves and warm breezes brushing across its walls. Carl and his companions sat on the stakes in the training grounds, swaying their legs about. A meeting of the reserve apprentices was well underway. Carl, you can beat all of us easily now, ever since you passed the trial. Monty tugged on his shirt, allowing the winds to kiss his belly and cool him down. He shifted his gaze to the conference hall beside the fence. There was respect in his eyes. That's not all he did. Akamuthorm was loudly kissing Carl's ass, but there was evident schadenfreude in his voice. He killed a drowner and a necker, and he lasted five seconds in a spar with Felix. He's worthy enough to join the conference, but they won't even introduce the new guys to you. And Roy wouldn't even tell you why he became bald again. They still think you're a kid. Carl's not even ten. Hi, still a kid, technically speaking. Lloyd patted his chest. Quietly, he said, They have their job, and we have ours. We should just train. If they see us slacking off, they're gonna punish us. This is too much. Charname shook his head in annoyance. We're reserve apprentices. Sooner or later, we'll be witchers. We should fight for our rights to join the meeting, and we need to ask them why we still can't take the pre-trial. It's been six months since we started training. When can we take the trial? I can't wait. Carl, you gotta help us out. Ask them. Carl's lips twitched. He rubbed his wrist and looked away from the flying griffin. The boy pushed himself off the stake and landed gracefully, and then he tiptoed toward the conference room. His friends followed closely. They hid under the windowsill and listened in to the meeting. So Cohen is the only remaining griffin? A deep voice asked. Carl could tell it was Letho. For now, yes, an unfamiliar voice answered. The youth in that voice was unmistakable, but there was also depression lingering within it. A long silence ensued. Our condolences, Cohen, a slightly hoarse voice said. Keldar rescued his imprisoned comrades. He died a hero. That's the best way any witcher can go out. Yeah. So what's the plan now? 
a voice of reason asked. Do you want to stay at the orphanage for a bit? It's our base. Makes it easier if you need someone to talk to. I've always wanted to see how Griffin signs work. Thank you for the offer, but I'd like to rent a house in the city. And Exena needs a job. Easy. Kid, take them to the business district. Dandelion needs some new staff members, if I remember correctly. Oh, and your girlfriend's there too, but she looks absolutely miffed. Speaking from experience, don't let her wait too long. Tell her everything. Be honest, and chuck a swallow just in case. What experience? That time you fucked a cow? Enough, Aiden. Stop with the slander, or I'm telling everyone what you did at the Pike's Grotto last time. You're making an embarrassment out of yourselves, fools, someone growled. Sorry you had to see that. If your partner finds a job at the ballroom too demanding, Gawain can get her another job on his turf. You have a ballroom? A silvery, lively voice asked. There's theater and dances? I love that, but I'm just a country girl who can't even read. I wonder if I can handle the job. Worry not, lady. There's a ton of different work there, and you're still young. You can learn. Ahem. May we have the honor of witnessing the cause of this tragedy, the Book of Shadows? A lively voice asked. It was filled with curiosity and anticipation. We'll check it for you. The boys could feel their heart leaping out of their chests. Shut it, you fool. That book is the Griffin's top secret. You think they'd let you see it just like that? The voice of reason lost its cool. Apologetically, Sarat said. Sorry, Cohen. He got his head banged up by kickymores and bear traps. He's intellectually challenged. Please, don't take it to heart. That will be all for now, friends. We'll be in contact again once Vesemir returns. The discussion had come to an end, and someone opened the door. The witchers emerged from the room and went back to their positions. Some went to the blacksmithing area, some went to the lab, some went to class, and some went to the farm. The reserve witchers had returned to the training grounds and went on with two-on-two -two sword fighting. They were wiping off their sweat as if they had been training for a long time. Carl put one hand behind his back like a teacher and pointed out all the mistakes his friends made. But still, they failed to escape the witcher's eyes. You kids love to eavesdrop, don't you? How did listening to the meeting feel like? Fun? Gerald approached the children and smiled stiffly. You can have all the fun you want now. Everyone, get on the stakes and give me three hundred squats. Carl, you're doing a thousand. Gerald, no. Cohen noticed the little scene, and he looked a little envious of how well things were going on here. Roy smiled. They're good kids most of the time, but they get up to things from time to time. Cohen looked around at the smithy, the lab, the farm, and the classroom. Witchers were teaching children the skills they needed to survive. As surprising as this was, Cohen said, You did it. You found so many apprentices. No, only five of them are actual apprentices. The other kids are regular students. They're only learning how to read, write, and support themselves when they grow up. Roy suggested, If you'd like, why don't you come over and teach them for a day or two? It was a tempting invitation. Keldar left him a mission before he passed. And this place might be perfect for the continuation of Griffin values. But the thought of Keldar brought him sadness. Perhaps another day, Roy. Lead us to the ballroom, please. Once Ixena has settled down, I shall lend you the Book of Shadows, as we promised. And I'd like that very much. Roy held his excitement down. One of the reasons he risked his life was for the chance to read the Book of Shadows. But please don't make this knowledge public. Cohn gave him a look of unspoken plea. Roy hesitated for a moment, but he nodded in the end. Not even Vesemir, a good friend of Keldar, had the chance to learn the Griffin's Bar, secret arts. Roy got that chance just by fighting. He knew he shouldn't ask for more, but Roy would try to slowly change Cohen's mind until he would willingly contribute to the Brotherhood. Most of the members weren't sources. At most, they could master Dual Sign. Geralt was perhaps the only one who could master Roar. Still, Roy wanted to broaden the members' horizons. The trio left the house of Gawain. Through the alder woods they went, and across the refurbished path they walked. To Novigrad's southern gates they went. A long, bustling line waited before the great gates. With each passing second, more people entered the city. Cohen noticed an odd phenomenon here. In most cities, the guards would approach witchers for interrogation. 
most of them would have grim faces. But to his surprise, the church's guards were respectful to Roy. They looked at him like he was some important figure, and they were courteous to him. They were allowed entrance easily. Novograd's roads were bustling with activity. They would get the occasional looks, but unlike in most cities, they weren't discriminatory. Still, some weren't friendly, but all of them remained calm. Some were even genuinely curious. But what puzzled Cohen were the things they muttered. Things like butcher of the sewers, guardians of justice, and killers of kidnappers. Why do they look at us like we're some sort of public figure? Roy noticed the surprise in Cohen's eyes, but he didn't explain. They still had a long way to go before success would wave its hand at them. Their work would only be done when Novogradians saw witchers as people they could look up to. It was early in the morning, but despite that, a third of the Dithi ballroom seats were filled. Roy scanned the first floor, but when he saw who was on the second floor, he froze. A gorgeous sorceress in a long purple dress was resting her chin on her hand, showing them a perfect smile. But the complaint and frustration behind that smile did not escape Roy. His heart sank, and a drop of sweat dripped down his forehead. Lita beckoned him. Coral, no wonder I didn't see you back at the orphanage. What brings you to the ballroom? Roy took the seat beside her. He wrapped his arm around her waist as he took in the scent of roses coming from her hair. And then he introduced the newcomers to her. Cohen and Ixena took their seats. They looked at the couple and exchanged a smile before they dug into their breakfast. At the same time, they watched the performance that was unfolding upon the stage. It was one that talked about witchers, one where the witchers took a request to eradicate the city of kidnappers. Why do you think I'm here? Lita picked up an oyster with one hand and squeezed some lemon juice onto it. Then she fed it to Roy, a big smile curling her lips. Say ah! Slow down. Slow down. Well done. Loud cheers and applause erupted. Even Cohen and Ixina looked invigorated. The handsome actor was dancing on the stage with a prop sword in his hand, fighting through the horde of despicable, dirty kidnappers. Slow down, my dear Coral. I can do this myself. Ow. Okay, okay. You do it. After she stuffed five raw oysters and three hard-boiled eggs into his mouth, she happily wiped his lips with a napkin. She grabbed the top of his head with her right hand and turned him around. So, Baldy, I just met a young lady from Aratusa, and she told me a certain someone rescued her from the clutches of an evil couple and made a promise to see her. I think that certain someone has plans for her. Lita stared straight into Roy's eyes. She had a big smile on her face, but that smile said something along the lines of, You'd better spill everything. Don't call me a baldy, Coral. I promise it'll grow back in two weeks at most. Roy flinched and quickly gulped down some stew. Are you talking about Toya of Aldersburg? It was nothing. Anyone with a conscience would help. I've forgotten all about it. The answer did not make Coral happy. She brushed her fingers across his arm and drew circles on his forearm. She pinched him and let go, her eyes glinting coldly. Her name is Kasiga. It's been two years, and you still remember her old name. You even remember where she comes from. You still care about her. There was jealousy in her voice. She's still a little girl, you pervy little. Ahem, Lady Lida, Master Roy, and hello, new friends. Welcome to Novograd's ballroom. I am Dandelion, the manager of this establishment. An attractive voice spoke. Dandelion elegantly approached the table and gave them a bow with his hand to his chest. His purple top and the feather on his hat gleamed under the light of the magical lamp. This is Cohen of the Greffin School and Ixena of Povis. Roy heaved a sigh of relief and pulled his arm away. He then gave Dandelion a grateful handshake and bumped shoulders. Dandelion gave him a subtle wink. Good afternoon, my new friends. What do you think of the performance? Incredible, Cohen complimented. There was still a hint of sadness in his eyes, and he instinctively commented, but the embellishment is a little over the top, the actor's swordplay leaves a lot to be desired, and the eyes don't look natural enough. Props? Anyway, the movements are. And then only muffled sounds could be heard. Ixena covered Cohen's mouth and smiled sheepishly at Dandelion. He means it's perfect. We've never seen anything as innovative as this particular performance. It'd be a miracle for the bards and poets not to slander witchers, let alone praise them. With pride in his heart, 
Dandelion puffed out his chest. It is exactly why I take the path less traveled. My conscience tells me I must correct the wrong perception the public holds of the witchers. So, Dandeli, on. Ixina just came to Novigrad, and she needs a job and a place to stay. Do you think she can work here? Roy tried his best to ignore the withering looks Coral was giving him. I think she's fine. Business is getting better. I'm dealing with more than a dozen shows every day. Our acting staff is exhausted. The first thing they do after they get back to the dorms is sleep. Dandelion glanced at Ixina. Ixina has an eye for good performance. All she needs is some training, and she's good to go. Are you sure? Surprised, Ixena finally let Cohen go. He huffed and puffed and gave his excited girlfriend a weird look. But I can't read. I won't even know what the script is talking about. Redania's most famous performer, Tarantino, started out as a farmer. Performers care not for who you are, only your talent and effort. I shall lead you to the office where my lovely Priscilla is, Dandelion said. She shall provide you with a position and a place to stay, but you will only start out with a regular pay and a house in the slums. I trust you'll understand where we're coming from. Thank you. With her hands tightly clasped before her belly, Ixina bowed at Dandelion, excitement welling in her heart. She then bowed at Roy as well. Dandelion nodded. Oh, Roy, I need to tell you something as well. Dandelion touched his perfectly maintained mustache. His eyes were sparkling and his face was lit up with delight. The Duchess of Toussaint, Honorable Lady Anna Henrietta, has given me an invitation. She wishes for me to perform in her kingdom before Lammas arrives. There was pride in Dandelion's voice. This is an honor no bard can refuse. There's two weeks left until Lammas arrives, and I shall be setting off in two days. I will be absent for a month, and I would like Aucus to accompany me. He shares a deep love for poetry, like I do. Roy paused for a moment. Oh, right. Dandelion's performance is held during Anna's husband's absence, and this guy managed to beguile Anna with his talents and fucked her. Sure, just ask Akas if he wants to go. He told me to ask you, probably worried you might have other plans for him. I see. A month, huh? Akas will go with you then. Roy was touched that his friends thought of him. He then looked at Dandelion closely and patted his shoulder, much to the bard's confusion. Dandelion, you once told me monogamy is not for you. I hope you've changed your mind since then. You have a lover waiting for you right here in Novigrad. Don't ever forget that. Don't cheat on her. I am a changed man. Dandelion's eyes glimmered, and he looked beyond the fence. I turned all of my love into poems for Priscilla, and I gave her my entire heart. I have spared none for any other woman. That's the truth. Coral scoffed in disdain. Dandelion, this is for your own protection you do well to remember my advice. Once they finished lunch, Dandelion led Cohen and Ixina downstairs. Lita was trying her best to see if Roy still had lingering feelings for the girl. A long while later, she finally had the answer she wanted. The maid shot him a look and reluctantly pulled out a letter from thin air. Here's the love letter from your little girlfriend, Kasiga. Take your time and enjoy it. She turned her back on Roy and pretended to dig into her salmon. Roy held the letter, but he was in no hurry to read it. How is she doing? Better? Magically modified, her disfiguration is gone, a beautiful flower waiting to blossom, I'd say. Is she doing well in Aratusa? She made three new friends, happier than she has ever been. Still misses you, though. You never wrote to her, and it broke her heart. The jealousy in her voice filled the air. Roy nodded and handed the letter back to her, much to Lita's surprise. Gently, he said, my dear Coral, she's just a young acquaintance of mine. I harbor no romantic feelings for her. If she's fine, then that's all I need to know. No need to read this letter. Lita froze for a moment, and then delight welled within her. She stared into his eyes, and dimples formed on her cheeks as a warm smile curled her lips. Oh, I'm not that petty. We can read it together. She rested her chin on his shoulder, her cheek huddling against his. She breathed down his ear and wrapped her arm around his other shoulder. Roy opened the letter. To my dearest friend Roy, two years have passed since our last goodbye in Aldersburg. Every time I stare into the seas crashing beyond the Academy's windows, I think of you and what you told me. Roy didn't even pay attention to the letter. So, how long will you stay this time? Lita drew circles on Roy's palm, and it tickled him. 
a month at the very least. I need to learn the Griffin's secret arts. The Book of Shadows contains invaluable magical knowledge, some of which might be useful even for you. But I've promised Cohen to never tell anyone else what I saw. I'll try to convince him otherwise, however. Whenever I encounter a problem concerning my magic, your smile always shows me the path ahead. Lita has shown me what you look like. You've changed so much. I nearly couldn't recognize you, but my heart tells me you're still the same boy I know. These changes are nothing but growth for you. I will do my best to follow in your footsteps and grow alongside you. And I did grow. I do hope you will be the witness to that. So I assume you'll be studying during the day. What about at night? Coral's voice was almost ethereal. He felt her lips on his cheeks, and he could feel her legs rubbing against his. I would like for you to come to Gorsvelin, my friend. It would encourage me very much. There is a pond on the island filled with lotus leaves and mayflies. Black fish swim beneath the surface, and an elm tree stands beside the pond. We can ride a boat together, but this time, I, I shall be the one performing a magic trick for you. Always yours, Toya Kasiga. You may call me whatever you please. Written in Aratusa, 13th of July, year 1262. I'll spend the night with you. Roy sighed and folded the letter. All he remembered were the opening and ending. The content went by his head, and he couldn't remember a thing. All he remembered was going home with Coral and messing around with her the whole afternoon, night, and morning. And then he went straight to Cohen's new house happily in the afternoon. Chapter 407. Mutated, an old house made of wood and stones, with a red roof and white walls. That was where Cohen stayed. An oil lamp shone on the lackluster living quarters and the witcher who was reading a book on the sofa. Once again, Roy had gotten the Book of Shadows from Cohen. But unlike how it used to be, the cover was no longer gleaming and shining. The power of infinite recording was no more. All the knowledge regarding Keldar and the souls trapped within its pages disappeared with the destruction of its core. Two thousand pages of content remained. Most of the content was written in northern common speech. Erland had already established Care Saren when he started writing the book, though a small part of the content was written in elder speech and its variants. Roy skimmed through the book. On its yellowing pages was the history of all the witchers who saw it, written in the form of notes and addendums. The book was divided into a few main parts, a brief explanation of the school's mission, swordplay, signs, the secret arts, alchemy tips and tricks, secret magical knowledge, and monsterology. Every part of it was then broken down into even smaller parts. For example, the alchemy section was divided into regular potions, decoctions, bombs, and oils. There were examples for everything on every page. For example, the Arrakis section had with it the records of Erlen's battle. He cast a mutated Igni and Yurdan, burning its mouth and turning all three Arakas into grilled crabs. At the end of the story, Erland wrote that the poisonous Arakas meat would be safe to consume as long as it went through ten minutes of intense cooking. A few pages later, Roy found himself engrossed by Erland's creative battle tactics and sign usage. Sword play aside, the depth and complexity of the knowledge contained within this book was far superior than the almanac of monsters and the stories the Brotherhood members told him. The Griffins took prep time in extreme and made it an art form. But Roy was not here to read these things. He flipped through the pages and arrived at the last part of the book, The Secret Arts. He skimmed through dual signs and went straight to the section that held his interest, The Roar, the thing that could change signs. He could still vividly imagine how Keldar bravely faced off against multiple griffins all by himself. Roy desired the power to cast a large-scale protective sign and send invisible chains after his targets. The section read, Elementals, Creatures of the Elements, Controllers of Chaos Energy. With a single magical roar, these creatures can summon the power of elements themselves. Hurricanes, lightning, flames, nothing is beyond them. Pioneers spent years and years within the depths of the void of meditation. Through the elemental dimensions they went, searching for the elementals that reside within. The pioneers risked their lives and wrote down the four roars of the elementals for us to learn. But be warned, adepts, should you attempt this, incredible talent and an iron will will be needed to pass the trial. 
Should you pass on the first try, you shall gain the privilege to learn this power. Should you fail, do not push yourself, or the consequences shall be dire. Roy took a deep breath and slowly flipped the page. What greeted him were a passage written in elder speech and a beautiful picture. In most cases, people could only communicate through sounds through a face-to-face -face encounter or by recording it with magical means. However, the pioneers took another path. They utilized the equally magical elder speech writing system and combined a few basic letters. If anyone could pronounce this combination, they would have imitated an elemental's roar. But pronunciation was not the only thing this secret art contained. If the user wished to use this power, then alongside the roar, they had to also create a vivid imagery of a certain rune in their minds that corresponded with the element of the roar. Blazing flames, blue waters, wispy clouds, and sturdy mountains. All were element, teus, but all were different. Imagining these wasn't hard, but not when the user had to create a lifelike image with perfect details of it in their minds. Roy memorized the combination for water and its rune. He tried to pronounce it, but the word couldn't roll off his tongue easily. It felt like someone jumbled up different letters that couldn't combine well with one another and forced them to work together. Roy sat cross-legged, calming his heart and clearing his mind. Five minutes went by. The young witcher took a deep breath and he let out a roar that reverberated through the living quarters. Ginvale? A gust of wind flew into the house. Roy closed his eyes to feel if any changes had taken place, but his mana remained silent. His character sheet showed no new information either. A frown furrowed his forehead. My pronunciation needs some improvement. I sound like a babbling toddler. It was his first try. The rune he imagined had nothing but the shape of a drop of water. He couldn't imagine what its color or edges looked like. The imagery was veiled behind something. I guessed as much. Shouldn't expect less from a sign that requires its user to create vivid images in their heads. No, perhaps it requires a great affinity for elements. Real sources can easily create that image in their heads. I'm just a guy with some elder blood within him. Still a long way away from a source. Roy shook his head, but discouraged he was not. He gave himself one month to figure this out. Roy spent the whole day in Cohen and Xena's house, but he made slow progress. Even after the sun had set and Cohen had come back with Xena, Roy still couldn't make out the rune. The look on Roy's face failed to escape Cohen's notice. He asked, Mate, are you trying to imitate a roar? Roy nodded. The element of water's roar. Take it slow. He took a deep breath. Keldar spent three days creating a full image in his head, it was then he learned the first roar and powered his sign up. I spent a whole month trying to do it. Cohen laughed at himself. But the moment I made that sound, I passed out. The elements raged within me, knocking me out. Once I regained consciousness, I gave up hope on mastering a mutated sign. That's what destiny wants for me. He shook his head, sighing. A confident smile tugged at Roy's lips. He closed the book and looked at the couple. So, how was your first day in Novigrad? Did it go well? I went around the city. It has been a while since I saw a place as bustling as Novigrad. Cohen eased up a little. It's even more bustling than Lan Exeter and Pont Vanis. Novigradians are friendlier than I thought. The Brotherhood's efforts are showing results. At least the locals do not bear that much ill will against us. Even took an easy request from the bulletin board. Found a missing cat that belonged to an old bat living all by herself. Made five crowns from that. A sigh escaped Cohen's lips. It's like free money, Roy nodded, smiling. Stay a while, and you'll fall in love with this place. And then you'll join us. What about you, Exina? The young lady turned red with excitement, and she spun around while holding Cohen's hand. Her white dress swayed with the wind, though her dancing still looked unpolished. I love this job. I love this place. She kept gushing like a child who just got treated to a big feast. I don't have to pick any greens. I don't have to feed the chickens. I don't have to do any of that. All I have to do is dance, sing, and listen to poetry and music. This is the life I've always wanted. I will be a Novigradian. I thought Dandelion said work was demanding, Roy joked. Oh, do not think of me as a woman of the city. Work of this magnitude is but child's play for this lady. She was starting to talk in rhymes, though it was a little off. Compared to the work I had to do at home, this is heavenly. 
I see. Roy looked at Cohen. He was a quiet, honest guy, while Xena was full of vigor and curiosity for a new world. I have a bad feeling about this. This is a world filled with temptation. NS, I wonder if they can hold on. I'll put the book here. Get some rest. I'll come back tomorrow. Where are you going, Roy? Sleep was not in Xena's plan that night. She said, let's go moongazing later. You should stay with Cohen, Roy declined with a smile. He was thinking of the woman who would be inviting him to share a bed with her. Can't let her wait. Guess it's another sleepless night. Roy's life went on with nothing eventful to take note of. By day, he would read the Book of Shadows and practice his roar and imagery, learning the sign of clamp. By night, he would either stay with his family or quarrel. Sometimes, they would do it in a room, sometimes in the lab, and sometimes in a boat on the sea. For more reasons than one, Roy was glad he went through a second trial, or he would have wrecked his body doing something so extreme. At the same time, Dandelion had dressed himself up majestically and set off for Toussaint with a gaudy Aucas by his side. On their merry way they went, where the celebration of Lammas in Toussaint awaited. Aucas set a course to Toussaint's Mont Crane Castle. He would scout the place out and set down a portal waypoint. Vesemir had returned from his short honeymoon trip. The news of Keldar's death came as a shock to him. He asked Coral to open a portal so he could pay his respects to his old friend. But Roy did not think Vesemir was too sad about this. In fact, he thought the Grandmaster felt happy for his friend. Envious, even. Dying after a great battle was one of the greatest ways a Witcher could go. Vesemir was particularly caring for Cohen. When he wasn't teaching the kids blacksmithing, he would summon Cohen to the orphanage and ask him how he was doing. Eventually, Cohen lost a little of his wariness of the place. Sometimes he would come for a visit, though he was still adamant about not joining the Brotherhood or sharing the Book of Shadows. Still, it was a good sign. Eventually, he would give in. The kids were too adorable to resist. On the other hand, Ixena was improving by leaps and bounds. Perhaps she did have a talent for theater. Not too long ago, she started to perform, though only as a supporting character. Still, her efforts were lauded by the acting staff. Everyone loved the straightforward lady who had a sailor's mouth. Cohen dragged Roy to one of her shows. She played the part of one of Cinderella's stepsisters. One week later, Roy was in Cohen's room, the sun shining on his anxious and solemn face. He was sitting cross-legged on the ground with his eyes closed. When he opened his eyes again, something glinted within them. He weaved a complex gesture with his fingers that fluttered like a butterfly's wings. At the same time, he took a deep breath and let out a roar. The mysterious, primordial roar ignited the chaos energy that lingered in the air. A gust of air coming from Roy blew the curtains away, the plates on the table falling everywhere. Azure lights shone and glimmered, and not a moment later, a slender figure popped into existence. He had black hair and heterochromatic eyes, and he was wearing manticore armor. The silhouette leapt over to Roy and sat down with his legs crossed. It was as if two identical witchers appeared in the room. They looked like twins, but one was inscrutable, while the other had a deep frown on his forehead. Roy stood up and cracked his joints, and the silhouette repeated his movements as uniformly as a shadow. A sigh of relief escaped Roy's lips, and he concentrated on his character sheet. You have learned the seventh sign. Clamp, original, dispels illusions or creates an illusory image of you. The duration of the image is affected by your spirit and sign level. Clamp, mirror image, mutated, you have listened to a nymph's roar imitation. Your sign has mutated. The image is no longer a decoration. It possesses part of your stats and passive skills. You have full command of the image. The image will disappear after sustaining a set amount of damage. You may also dispel the image yourself. The duration and a amount of power it possesses is affected by your spirit and sign level. If you embed a wing flap into the image, it shall concentrate all the water element around it within its body. When the image disappears or is destroyed, it will release a frost nova around it. 60 seconds later, the image disappeared into thin air, and a frost nova engulfed the surrounding area with chilly winds and ice. Even the ground was covered in frost. Roy tried to wipe it off, but all it did was hurt his hand. Offensive power aside, if someone gets hit by this, 
they'll get slowed at worst and frozen at best. The image lasts for one minute and is only as strong as a regular adult man. It has most of my passive skills, but the thing is stupid. It can't use any signs. A bit useless in battle, unless I embed it with a wing flap. A walking frost bomb that does anything I say is a good crowd control skill. It might come in handy in some situations. Like stealth bombs. Roy turned his attention to another sign. The roar of the water element could change two signs, clamp and axii. Axie had mutated as well. Axii. Axie infiltrates through your target's eyes, controlling their minds and movements for a time. The potency is affected by your spirit, sign level, and the target's will. Axie puppet. Mutated. Axie can control your target's mind and actions. The sign can work even without casting it at your target's eyes. The mind control is deeper, and it can change the target's perception. Wing flap effect. The water element that lingers in the air will power Axie up. You no longer have to cast Axie into your target's eyes for it to take effect. Axie's duration and effect is now doubled. Roy rubbed his chin. Okay, this isn't mass hypnosis, unlike Keldar's Axie. Guess this is a single target effect. I can control their perception of things, huh? Wonder if I can get anyone to harm themselves? He cocked his eyebrow and got an idea. Or maybe I can change how they see themselves. Like maybe they'll think they're chickens or something. That's terrifying. This is the worst kind of torture imaginable. Roy held his fluttering heart down and started getting himself used to the roar to see how powerful wing flap and mutated signs were. And then he realized a pattern. Roy had to wait for five minutes every two times he used wing flap. If he cast a third time in succession, the chaos energy in the air would backfire at him, just like how it did to Keldar. And the training went on. One month had passed. There was a case of insubordination during that month. With Carl's support, the remaining reserve apprentices cut off all their hair and strapped their swords behind their backs like witchers. They went on a protest. They demanded to know when they could take the pre-trial. It had been six months since they started training, and still they had no idea when their trial would take place. The protest failed, however. The reserve members were taken down and subjected to a week of toilet cleaning. Roy cast his mutated axia on the leader, Carl. He made Carl think he was a girl. The boy changed into a dress and tied his hair into a braid. Then he played jump rope with Vicky and the girls for an hour. Since then, the kids toned down their shenanigans. There was a reason they couldn't administer the pre-trial, and it was simple. After Lita started trying to modify the formula, she realized it was harder than she thought. Once, she tried to weaken the effects of the mutation to increase the rates of success, but it had little effect. The orphanage would not conduct another trial until she made a breakthrough. The witchers had a change of mind. They could not afford to lose any of the children. The orphanage was running smoothly, and Roy's training was well underway, aside from the time he and Cantilla flew to the nearby mountains on Griffon's back to kill a gravier. Most of the time, he stayed in the city. Every week, Roy would learn a new roar, and his signs would power up. The second week was the roar of fire. Igni had mutat, ed into ignifire, and with roar and wing flap, the fireball would absorb the fire element in the air and double its power. Now its effective range was 40 meters instead of 20. It was on par with a real fireball spell. The third week was the roar of earth. This time, Quen and Heliotrop mutated. Quen Sanctuary, mutated, summons a 5 meter diameter dome around you, shielding you and your allies from physical attacks. Wing flap effect, earth element in the air will gather around the sanctuary, bolstering its defense dramatically. Heliotrope Sanctuary had a similar effect, but against magical attacks. These two signs boosted Roy's supportive abilities in group battles by a lot. The fourth week was the roar of air, and this time Ard and Yurden mutated. Ard Static Shock mutated. You may create high friction between the elements in your body and create a lightning bolt to burn and numb any target within 20 meters. Wing Flap Effect. Air element in the air resonates with your sign, causing your target to be hit by a second bolt of lightning. Damn, I thought this was going to be some Rasengan kind of skill, or a shockwave. But lightning? And wing flap can summon another one to hit the same target? Lightning never strikes the same place twice? Yeah, ditch that. 
Wonder if this will cause a lightning storm if I keep powering it up. Roy shook his head and tossed that ridiculous idea out the window. Now he had three offensive ranged attacks. Fury Fire, Static Shock, and Gabriel. Already he had come up with a combo. First, he would cast Clamp and have the image get close to the target. Then he would invoke the Frost Nova, and then a Stun Bolt would keep the target in check, followed by Static Shock's numbing effect. Finally, Fury Fire would swoop in and explode. Roy was like a mix between an archer and a mage now, but he couldn't last long. Twenty fireballs, lightning bolts, and stun bolts would take all the mana he had. Unlike a source, he couldn't tap into all the chaos energy lingering in the air and go on until the recoil took place. But he had an advantage. His spells needed no incantation or gestures. All he had to do was roar and cast the sign. He could send out a barrage of signs before a mage could even get through their incantation. And then for the final sign, Yerdin Halo, mutated, summons a circular halo in a three-meter radius around you. The halo lasts for five minutes. Any enemy that steps into the halo will have their speed lowered and reaction time increased. Ethereal enemies will be forced back into the material world, and instant teleportation's effect is drastically lowered in this halo. The halo moves with you. Wing flap effect. The halo's area of effect, potency, and duration doubles. It's not invisible chains, but at least the trap can move now. Let's see how the wraith's like this. If I cast this and suppression at the same time, it'll cause a double debuff for my enemies. It's like getting rooted to one spot and being unable to leave. And with that, all seven signs had been mutated. Their powers had risen to a level beyond Roy's imagination. He had two systems he could go with in battle. The first one was the aforementioned long-range system involving a Frost Nova, Stun Bolt, Lightning Bolt, and Fireball Explosion. The second one was a contingency for situations where Roy had enemies closing in on him. He would use Suppression alongside Halo to wear his enemies down, or he could combine Fear with Devour to end the battle swiftly. Aside from Erland, I'm probably the only one who possesses all mutated signs now. He turned his attention to the last skill he learned. Griffin Arts Level 5, you have learned Mutated Signs and Wing Flap. And that left Dual Sign to be learned. But if he did that, he couldn't use his sword or hand crossbow. I'm a Witcher. Gotta be able to switch between ranged and close quarter combat. Roy was in no hurry to learn Dual Signs. One month had passed, and it was now the middle of August 1262. It was time for the next part of his plan. Chapter 408, Geralt's Change. The rain had passed, the black clouds gone. Once again, clear blue skies graced the land. The great sun shone far above the heavens, its light refracting into all colors of the rainbow through the droplets in the air. Beneath that rainbow stood an orphanage, living in the quiet woods. The rainbow smiled at the small, picturesque place that changed the lives of some poor orphans forever. Another glorious morning for the children. They were reciting a poem with Kian leading them. It was a poem regarding witchers, written by Dandelion before he left. Vesemir was in the smithy, still wearing his apron and mittens as usual. Blacksmith apprentices were going about their day, creating new items with Vesemir giving them orders. A few scissors and hoes stood on the wooden rack in the corner, though they left a lot to be desired. Letho was in the lab, overseeing Vicky and her friends making spirit potions. The kids were young, but they could already make a dozen or so common potions like marigold and spirit potions, though the quality was lacking. Beyond the woods stood a few scarecrows made of burlap sacks. Siret was on the farm, teaching the kids how to shoot an arrow. Aukis would usually be there with his brother, but the guy was in Toussaint and still hadn't returned just yet. Roy had handed all the Brotherhood's coins to Siret and handed the business management to him as well. Since Roy had to be out and about, Serret the math whiz became the finance manager. A brown, gleaming horse stood in the stable beside the orphanage. It grinned and made weird noises through its teeth. At the same time, the horse rubbed its head against the witcher. Its ears were pricked up and flapping like little wings. All right, I know I've been neglecting you lately. I shouldn't have left you in the hands of the kids. Look, I brought you more food, and I'm going to massage you. Roy patted Wilt's face and placed a bucket full of carrots, medics, and corn beside the trough. While Wilt was eating the treat, 
Roy brushed its back. Wilt munched on the carrot and let out a happy snort, and then he breathed down the witcher's face. You've forgiven me? Good boy. Tell me if this feels good. Wilt whinnied. Roy patted its neck and scrubbed even better. Lita was standing under the shadow of the elm tree, smiling at the witcher. A breeze billowed her black dress and fiery red hair. You're raising a horse and a griffin. You should consider a career as a druid, not a witcher. She patted the cat's head. Griffin mewed in protest, but she pushed it down her cleavage. Perhaps I might learn the ways of an animal tamer. Roy gave Coral a knowing look. I heard druids are masters of nature, and to an extent, they possess powers akin to wild animals. Coral raised her head and bit her lip. Well, should I open a portal to Kaidu then? You can learn from the druids. I'm eager to see what kind of surprise you might bring back with you. That'll have to wait, at least until I'm done with the business at hand. Roy turned around. A witcher in bare school robes and twin swords strapped to his back approached them. He was none other than Geralt. Did the kids get on your nerves again? Roy smirked at the children who were behind Geralt. They were scrambling to dodge the pendulums that were swinging down on them. They've been working hard lately to catch up to Carl. Geralt shook his head. He looked at the couple and joked, Is it a good time to talk? I'm not interrupting, am I? Roy cocked his eyebrow and put his apron on the stable fence. Geralt of Rivia, a joker, never thought I'd live to see the day. I was born with a sense of humor. Oh, very well. Eskel, that old dog, found a woman with horns, and he wouldn't stop showing off. Lambert has been out and about lately, and he seems lively. I did not think he would look so happy, just being a sword instructor. He must have slept with someone's wife or girlfriend. It's getting on my nerves. Gerald shook his head, a hint of exasperation hiding in his voice. Yeah, the guy needs some love, Roy thought. Gerald had been quiet for a while since he joined the Brotherhood. At least Roy never saw Gerald sleeping around with anyone. And now, Vesemir, Lambert, and Eskel all had a partner, but Gerald was still single. Poor butcher of Blaviken. Roy looked at the sorceress, and Lita shot him a warm smile, though she was surprised Roy would suddenly turn around. Gerald's lips twitched, and he took a deep breath. You're not here just to crack a joke, White Wolf. So, what is it this time? Roy crossed his arms, and Lita approached him, grabbing his arm. Griffin seized the chance to escape the suffocating cleavage. It mewed loudly as it climbed up Roy's head, burying its face into Roy's short hair, though its eyes were fixated on the sorceress who almost suffocated it earlier. There was hesitation in Geralt's eyes. A moment of silence later, he heaved a sigh. Do you remember the prophecy you told me back in Kaer Morhen, about the end of Sintra? If memory serves me right... The invasion is soon. Worry hid deep within his voice. If war were to take place, Princess Ciri, Geralt's unexpected child, would be deeply affected. She was still residing in the kingdom right now. The prospect of war worried Geralt. It's mid-August of 1262 now. In less than one year, the war will come, somewhere during July of 1263. Roy's smile was wiped off his face. Grimly, he said, the Nilfgaardian troops will cross Amel, pass Erlenwald, and invade Sintra. That marks the First Northern War. The lands between Yaruga's south coast, Amel, and Sintra will be incinerated by the flames of war. Lita spaced out for a moment. According to Roy's prophecy, she died in the Battle of Sodden Hill, an event triggered by the Nilfgaardian invasion. But everything has changed. She huddled closer to Roy. The young witcher continued. The situation is obvious. Sintra's king and queen have noticed Nilfgaard's goal. Nilfgaardian troops are gathering in Amel as we speak. It is as you have said. I've not been in Sintra for a while, but I did hear some news. Sintra's royalty has invited ambassadors from numerous kingdoms to talk of a solution. There was a somber look in Geralt's eyes. Verdun, Carrick, Sidaris, Brugge, Skellige Isles, and Lyria and Rivia. Those are the ones I know. Perhaps there's more. One of the ambassadors is Raymond himself. He left his wife alone to join this conference and gave Dandelion the opening to sleep with Anna. Things are not looking good, Gerald said. The conference will yield no results. Roy sighed and patted Griffin's neck. It hopped onto Wilt's back and climbed up to its head, all the while swaying its tail. According to my premonition, Sintra will face the Nilfgaardian army alone. None of the kingdoms saw the threat Nilfgaard posed.
Roy shook his head. They thought Nilfgaard's army was a bunch of untrained amateurs who could be defeated with no effort at all. And Nilfgaard is showing them just that by pretending they can't break through Sintra's defenses. But the real situation is very different, I imagine? Roy's credibility was going up with every passing moment, and Gerald had to ask. Exactly. The Northern Realms let their guard down and underestimated the strength and number of the invaders. Sintra fell before the strength of the Southern Army. A somber silence fell upon them. Wilt noticed the sorrow in the air, and it licked the back of Roy's hand. Griffin stood up and patted Roy's head. To an extent, all three of them were people from the Northern Realms. Geralt might have followed the code of neutrality and stayed out of wars, but he despised wars, especially invasive ones. Lydda was a scholar, and she, too, hated wars. Mages would be forced to join the front lines and take the lives of many with their magic. Geralt, we cannot do anything about this. Roy shook his head regrettably. There are barely a dozen of us. That's far from enough to change the outcome of a war. If you try to interfere, all that's waiting for you is certain death. You misundi, restand me. I am but a witcher. I do not possess the ability to save everyone, and I do not wish to see my brothers throwing themselves at imminent doom. Yet, I must try to save Ciri, Geralt answered. He wasn't that proactive a person, but after joining the Brotherhood, a huge change in his life, he would want to do more changes if he could. We must travel to Sintra and have an audience with the Queen. Tell them what will happen no matter what. Geralt had resolve in his eyes, his ponytail billowing in the wind. We must see Ciri. Geralt looked at the Alder Woods. He could almost imagine the hellscape Sintra would become once the war broke out. Ciri would be homeless and tormented. Reflexively, he said, If it's possible, let's bring Ciri back to Novigrad. She can live with the other kids. Make her one of us. His voice was almost a whisper. A whisper that most people couldn't hear. But in the end, that whisper filled with resolve. It might not be the same luxury she has, but at least she won't have to suffer the fate of a princess who has lost her homeland. Roy paused for a moment, and then he felt proud of Geralt. Looks like I didn't waste my time. The old Geralt wouldn't have said something like that. He'd just passively wait for destiny to hand him everything. The Brotherhood is changing everyone. Never thought you'd say that, Geralt. You've been thinking about it, haven't you? Roy agreed with Geralt's sentiment. Geralt nodded. Siri and I formed a bond thanks to destiny, but I could never ask her to lead a life of poverty, not when she's a princess. But now that I know what the future has in store for her, I have no reason to stay idle. We have enough to support her. It is time to welcome my unexpected child. It's fine even if Kalanth disagrees, but if Siri doesn't want to come, then I shall wait. Well done, Roy cheered for Geralt in his mind. There's no reason to react when you know what will happen. Make the first move and change whatever outcome you can. Gerald, Siri is one of the more important parts of my plan. I shall go with you. For a moment, Roy saw the tomboyish girl with ashen hair and emerald eyes again. Siri is a good friend of mine. I need to help her. Hold it, Coral interjected. She looked at them suspiciously before finally setting her eyes on Roy. You never told me you knew the princess of Sintra. Don't give me that look, Coral. Roy looked miffed. She's not even ten years old. Now that's just being paranoid. The doubt in Coral's eyes didn't go away. It thickened, in fact. This is not farewell, Siri. We're the same kind of people, you and I. Destiny has decreed that we meet in the future. Oh shit. Roy decided to launch a preemptive strike before Coral could tear him apart. He pushed away Lita's fringe prey, pulling her closer and whispering into her ear. What were you thinking, my dear Coral? Cast any more doubt on me, and I'll show you what Clamp can do. You won't even have the strength to get out of bed the next day. Coral felt her heart flutter and her face burn. She shot Roy a dirty look, but the mage leaned closer to Roy and kept quiet. Geralt saw everything. He let out a long sigh in his heart. Like a wolf that was licking his wound, he remained silent and melancholic. A tiny teardrop welled in the corner of his eye. I wish Yen was that gentle. Geralt imagined something that would never happen. Sorry you had to see that, Geralt. Back to the matter at hand. We'll be going to Sintra together, but first, we'll make a detour to Vizima. Why do you want to go to Vizima? Geralt asked. 
Those brats want to take the pre-trial? Well, it's their lucky day. Roy looked at the boys. They were starting a two-on-two -two sparring session. Coral can't do the modifications as fast as we want her to do all by herself. It'd be years before she could increase the trial's rate of success. Coral nodded. The more she researched, the more she realized it was nigh impossible to modify the trial all by herself. And so, I'm going to enlist the help of an acquaintance, a mage and genius alchemist who goes by the name of Kalkstein. Ever heard of him? All the color drained from Lita's face. Siri is one thing, but you know that madman as well? What? Is something the matter? No, he's not exactly a criminal, but she had a weird look on her face. Coral wanted to laugh, but there was respect in her eyes. Kalkstein is a gifted alchemist. He's an expert in flames, explosions, and matter composition. His mind is filled with bizarre ideas, and he's an adventurous soul. But he hates rules the most, and the man is fearless. Once, he experimented on himself just to see how his new bomb would affect magical shields. It was in Bannard's dorm, and he succeeded. Succeeded in turning the dorm into rubble. Fortunately, he was the only one around, so no deaths, but still, he was expelled. The mage community still talks about it to this day. She paused for a moment. Any Magic Academy graduate has heard of him before. And the man is an unpredictable ball of chaos, hard to get along with. Roy's lips twitched. He just had a glimpse into the past of that unkempt, mousy man, and he expected no less from that maverick. He's fine, at least he never goes back on his word, and he's a genius in research. Are you sure you can convince him? Lita looked at Roy suspiciously. I have to try. Luck plays more of a factor than persuasion skills. If he's interested in the trial, then everything will be fine and dandy. And Berengar lives in Vizima as well. We'll be needing more manpower after the expansion next year. Planning in advance never hurts. I'll try to convince him to join us. Even if I fail, it's fine. I'll just keep talking until he changes his mind. And Roy gained Geralt's respect. I've never seen any witcher who's this persistent and shameless. There was also a third reason. He needed to see Vivian and Ada. The information about the first war could be used as a bargaining chip to exchange for some useful stuff. And the Church of Virtue should take the Brotherhood's side. One week, Roy held Coral's hand and looked at Geralt. Solemnly, he promised, I will return even if the mission ends in failure. Geralt nodded. I shall be waiting for the good news then. So, care to open a portal to Vizima, Coral? Roy took Griffon and placed it on his shoulder. Coral sighed. Chapter 409 Vivienne and Ada A reflection of the sun slept on the surface of Lake Vizima. The waters shimmered and glimmered, dancing with the wisps of fog that blanketed it all. Before the lake, a young witcher stood. On the other side of the lake was where the bustling trade quarter sat, covered in a thin, foggy veil. A morning breeze blew, bringing with it the scent of lake water, seaweed, and fresh soil. Into the waters Roy went, his destination the center of the lake. Slowly, the water covered his boots, then his pants, and then he was already waist-deep. Arendite swam through the water, cutting the water that lay ahead of it. It trembled and dispersed manna into the water, and Roy's pendant shivered. A beautiful silhouette emerged from the depths of the lake, circling the witcher at unbelievable speeds. Like a beautiful mermaid, she swam around him, celebrating his return. Eventually, the silhouette broke through the surface, revealing a slim, slender body. Beads of water slid down her silky, smooth skin, her body gleaming like a gorgeous pearl under the sunlight. She flung her hair around, letting it tumble upon her shoulders before flinging it one last time, covering half of her face. Her face was as petite and gorgeous as a doll, her nose aquiline, her eyes as clear as gemstones, and her lips as lustrous as the petals of a blooming rose. An innocent smile tugged on her lips, bewitching those who had the honor to lay eyes on it. Her dimples were like little whirlpools, sucking in the attention of those who would stare for a moment too long. Vivian, age, 355 years old. Status, Lady of the Lake Nymph, patron goddess of the Church of Virtue, requires higher perception. A lovely morning to you, Lady Vivian. Roy of Lake Vizima hails you. Roy sheathed Arondite and put one hand before his chest as he bowed to Vivian. I have been waiting, Roy of Lake Vizima. Vivian's tail swayed under the water and she slowly approached him, her eyes trying to see through his soul. 
Surprised by what she saw, she said, It has been but a year, and yet your powers have grown tremendously. I sense power in your bloodline, your flesh, and something beyond that. Something terrible. A frown furrowed Vivienne's brows, and she took in the scent around her, as if she wanted to feel something. But then she let that curiosity go. You were but a fledgling a year ago, but now you possess the strength to fend for yourself. This is a very pleasant surprise. It's all thanks to the trial. I've passed my second one. Roy held her outstretched hand and kissed the back of it. For a moment, all he could smell was the scent of lilies. He ignored the last part of Vivienne's comment and answered, But you too have grown, and at a much faster rate than I. You shine like a star in the night sky. I cannot begin to fathom the depths of your power. Vivian kept all her magical energy in check, and nobody could tell how powerful she was. The fishtail aside, she would look like a beautiful girl next door, but every movement she made radiated a sense of regality. Whenever Roy laid eyes on her, he would see the whole of Vizima within her. He could see countless whirlpools spiraling around her. She was nature itself. She was Lake Vizima itself. During his training, Roy vaguely saw the nymph of the elemental dimensions, and Vivienne reminded him of that. Leave the pleasantries for your lover. We shall do away with the formalities. Vivienne smiled and waved her hand. Let's take this somewhere else. I don't want to get them in trouble, and you should see Ada as well. Clouds of chilly fog encompassed Roy and Vivienne. Everything around Roy spun, and he lost his footing, but the young witcher didn't resist. A moment later, he found himself standing on solid ground once more. Vivienne had taken him to her mist-covered palace. The pillars were as dilapidated as the last time Roy saw them. Seaweed and dewdrops hung from them. Vivienne had taken her seat on the throne. It was something made out of a gigantic seashell decorated with pearls and seaweed. She placed her arm on the armrest and rested her chin on the back of her hand, her tail swaying languidly before her. She was like a fish who left its habitat that flapped its tail around. A sigh escaped her lips, and bright lights shone in the air. Within the light, an irregular, spherical item sat, and then it burst apart, like fireworks. A lean woman in an oversized white dress appeared in the palace seemingly out of nowhere. Her rosy brown hair tumbled down her torso like a gleaming waterfall. Her skin was almost shining, and not an inch was blemished. Good morning, Lady Vivienne. Is something the matter? Vivienne smiled at her and nodded at the witcher standing behind Ada. Her behavior suggested a sisterly relationship between her and Ada instead of a master-servant bond. Roy, what brings you to Vizima? You should have told me you were coming. Ada's eyes squinted as a big smile curled her lips. She happily approached the witcher and extended her hand. Roy bowed and looked at Ada calmly. Not a hint of makeup was seen on her face. The hard lines around her face spoke of her stubborn nature, but her eyes were slightly slanted, granting her a certain allure. A confident smile tugged on her lips, the same confident smile successful men had. It has been a year, Princess Ada. You seem a lot healthier. Roy looked at her hair. No longer was it as pale as it used to be. Oh, don't call me princess. You saved my life. You're my friend. Just call me by my name. Ada noticed where he was looking, and she twirled her hair. My hair color changed not too long after you lifted the curse. Lady Vivienne said that's the sign the curse is truly gone. My hair is now back to its original color. Speaking of which, you changed as well. Ada stared at his hair for a moment before she shifted her gaze. You used to be about my height, but now you're half a head taller than I am, and your eye color changed, and you got muscly. Ada pinched Roy's arm and Roy's cheek twitched. Didn't expect you to come, so finally decided to join the church and make a change? Anticipation glinted in Ada's eyes. I'm already a member of another organization. That's too bad. Roy looked at the ladies for a moment and changed the subject. Ada, Lady Vivienne, it's been a while since I was here. How's the church doing? Everything well? Ada looked at Vivienne, and the nymph nodded. We made the right move, changing our plan. Ada raised her head and circled the witcher with pride in her heart. Two-thirds of the 128 villages in rural Vizima have opened their hearts to the church. We have overwhelmingly more believers than the Eternal Fire and Melatele in Lake Vizima and nearby Tamaria River. 
she balled her right fist and swung it up happily. Our believers now number in the thousands, excluding ten priests and thirty Vodianoi. With a wave of her hand, another light screen appeared in the air, this time showing devout faces of the churchgoers. They were all praying to Vivian's statue. Incredible. Roy's eyes were filled with surprise. In just one year, a nameless church managed to amass a thousand believers, and that was just in Vizima. Roy couldn't imagine how much power they would hold if they expanded. This is what destiny wants, Roy. This is an eventuality that would have happened one way or the other. Ada looked at Vivian with respect in her eyes. Unlike the other gods, Lady Vivian requires no tithing. All she wants is pure, unadulterated faith. She just needs her believers to pray once every day. Vivian switched positions. She placed her hands before her belly and sat up straighter. It was an attempt to look holy, but when Roy looked at her, she shot him a wink. And the lady provides her blessing in return. The church has helped with the fishing, changing the lives of fishermen for the better. No longer do they have to worry about how they will get their next meal. No longer do they have to worry about floods or drowners. S. He nodded. Our more fortunate brethren have also chipped in for the underprivileged believers, tiding them through tough times. Roy nodded. Vivian never did anything evil. She never stepped out of the lake, and she did her best to keep the lake monsters in check, keeping the civilians safe. Ada was the high priestess and the only member of the top brass. Her ambitions lay in expansion. She would never take any donations for herself. Roy thought the church's mission of guiding its believers to the light of kindness and living by the knightly order was a bit too idealistic, but having some idealists around was not a bad thing. At the very least, the church cared for its believers, and its patron goddess would grant her blessings from time to time. Roy could see how they managed to get this far. What about Foltest? What's his stance on your operation? Roy asked. Still trying to keep you guys down? Ada took a deep breath, her chest heaving. With frustration in her voice, she said, That old git got his royal consultants to do his dirty deeds. Those whores go around barely wearing anything in an attempt to seduce every man they meet. They come to the lakeside and disrupt our activities. Scantily clad women? Roy interjected. You mean the sorceresses? Yes, Kira Metz and Triss Marigold, who else? A tense Ada shook her head, scoffing. Cunning women, they are. They scare off the believers, but don't lay a finger on them. They complete their task and don't get on the lady's bad side, but they're getting on my nerves. Ada continued. It's worse in the city. Anyone who's caught mentioning the name of the church or the lady is carried off to the dungeons for interrogation. Same thing goes for anyone who prays to the lady. The city folk have no choice but to do their prayers in the sewers. The same place the lion-headed spider set up its altar. But you cleared it out. Foltest is incorrigible. Ada shook her head. Matter-of-factly, she said, the church's rise will not topple his reign. On the contrary, it build rapport with the citizens, consolidating his rule. But he is blind to that fact. He insists on the act of oppression. Even tried to marry me off to that Redanian brat. But I refused. The Redanian brat? Wait, is she talking about Radovid the Heartless? But his oppression will fail, she chuckled. Adamantly, she announced, in a matter of years, the whole of Lake Vizima and Tamaria River will be filled with the ladies' believers. By then, even Foltest will have to think twice before trying to oppress us again. Roy turned his attention to Vivian. She was playing with her hair and giving him a gentle smile. The church will see a successful rise, no doubt about that. But if I may ask, what's the purpose of expanding the church's influence? Roy asked softly. Once you convert everyone around Lake Vizima into Lady Vivian's believers, will you set your sights on all the lake areas in the northern realms? What then after that? Will you set foot in the south and expand your influence there as well? Worry not, my knight. Vivian finally spoke, her voice as silvery and delightful as the spring breeze. The other lakes belong to my sisters. Last, I have no desire to take their territory from them. My ambition does not extend that far. Our expansion will eventually come to an end, she said seriously. All I want is for the people of Lake Vizima and Tamaria River to put their faith in me and live in peace. When my believers meet their eventual death, they can start a new life in my kingdom. 
Roy was reminded of the time Vivian converted some souls into creatures that lived in the lake. There was a hint of complaint on Ada's face. Her ambition extended much, much further than just Lake Vizima and the river, but she wouldn't go against her patron goddess. The lady's wish is my dream. Then perhaps I can lend you a hand in this journey of yours. He looked at the ladies once more. And that brings us to the point of this visit. Two pieces of information. He was going to use those in exchange, e for a favor or two. The first one would be the news of Foltest's illegitimate daughter, the one he sired with Louisa. But then he promised Louisa to never tell anyone about this affair. Dragging an innocent girl into this matter was low, so he forgot about that. He organized his words and cut straight to the second piece of news, the First Northern War, or at least part of it. At first, Ada looked bemused about the news, but then her eyes shone. The Nilfgaardian troops will be invading Sintra and annihilating it by July next year? Are you sure you're not joking, Roy? My premonition is the result of my trial, and it has withstood the test of time. I can guarantee it's real. Roy turned his attention to the ladies once more. And this is what I saw. Sintra, once a regal country, reduced to a hellscape filled with the blood of its people. The smokes of war billowed in the air, and the Nilfgaardian army pilfered and plundered the fallen nation. You might think it preposterous, but it's true. Whether you wish to believe it or not, is up to you. My knight, I can glimpse into moments of the future and the past through the waters. Vivienne smiled. I've been expecting this visit, and I knew you'd come with important news. The lady believes him? Ada swung her fists in ecstasy and quickly paced around the chamber. This changes everything. Now that I know how that war will end, I can concoct a plan around it. I can make a huge profit and gain even more following. If I'm lucky, I can even change how Foltis sees us. This is a big boon, Roy. In the heat of the moment, Ada gave Roy a tight hug. The young witcher enjoyed the hug. The princess smelled nice. After all the teasing Lydda did to him, this was nothing. How should I thank you? There is no need for that. Roy shook his head. A witcher could never gain anyone's trust in Vizima. The information would be wasted on him, but if he divulged it to the princess, then that could change the game. Ada could maximize the profit gained from this nugget of knowledge. Six months ago, I and a few witchers established a brotherhood in Novigrad. But we only have about a dozen members as of now. The brotherhood's foundation is still shaky, and expansion will prove to be difficult. Roy pleaded, Lady Vivienne, Ada, if it's possible, I would like you to lend us a hand when the Brotherhood finds itself embroiled in a crisis it cannot handle alone. If it's possible, I'd like the lady to step in herself. Roy, you are the knight I personally appointed. Vivienne shook her head, her tail slapping the wet ground. Even without this nugget of knowledge you so generously shared with us, I would have still lent a hand if you were in trouble. I trust you would do the same for me. You underestimate the importance of this information, Roy. You deserve an extra reward. Ada put on her princess act and said seriously, Say the word. What would you like? Coins or something else? With praise in her voice, she said, I like your idea of the brotherhood. You're different from the other witchers. All they do is wait around and twiddle their thumbs. Roy rubbed his chin. Well, if you insist, then I'd like some Temerian Orans. The Brotherhood will be needing more funds in the coming year. How does 10,000 Orans sound? I can get more if you need. And with that, Roy managed to fill his dried-up money reserve. That's plan one done. Stay for a bit, Roy. Ada patted her chest. She offered, I'm going to pay for all your expenses, and I might need your help. Some of our areas need professionals. Roy was ready to hear what Ada needed, but Vivienne interjected. Ada, Roy has something else to do. She waved at the witcher, her eyes clear as water. Do what you have to do, my knight. We can solve our problems ourselves, but don't forget that you always share a bond with us. We'll have your back. Come visit if you have time. Thank you. Before Roy left, Vivienne said something cryptic. A piece of advice before you leave. I sense the presence of something terrible and ominous within you. It was there the last time we met, but the feeling wasn't that pronounced. But this time, I can feel it wriggling and squirming right at the edge of reality. Control your power. Use it wisely. Do not let it corrupt you. Don't lose yourself to it. Is she talking about the tentacles? 
But that's the sign of my will, Roy nodded. Worry not, lady. He had a strong feeling that his power would never devour him. He had a feeling that was an absolute truth. I will always be the same Roy you know. Chapter 410 An Exchange Noon The sun hung high in the sky, scorching the air of Vizima. Gusts of dreary hot wind trudged through the streets and entered the temple area. The hot wind's kiss overwhelmed the people with a sense of drowsiness, excluding a certain someone in a moss-filled alleyway. A muscular witcher with wild eyes appeared in the alley. What lay behind him was a pile of rotting garbage that filled the air with a rancid, nauseating scent. Flies buzzed in the air, and two men gobbled up all the rotten food from the dump, barking like dogs. Roy tossed the orins into the air and wiped the disgusting water off his boots by scrubbing the soles against the ground. Back when the church was still around, the knights would patrol these areas, scaring off any petty criminals from committing any crimes. The safety and hygiene of this place saw a huge boost, but now that the church was gone, the temple area once again became synonymous with squalor and street crime. Roy was just passing by, and already two men tried to rob him. Lebiota's Hospital and the Church of Eternal Fire were just nearby. This was a transgression against what was holy. Roy, in all his magnanimity, purged a few of the pieces of scum from Vizima. He used puppet and made them think they were dogs. And then he robbed them. Berengar's not here, Roy sighed, his eyes dim. Roy wanted to see Berengar, but he was nowhere to be found. After some digging around, he was told Berengar had left Vizima for two months. Nobody knew where he went. Guess that mission will have to be put on hold. Roy made some complex gesture with his left hand and tossed the coins into the air. He caught them with his right hand, but when he opened his hand once more, the coins were gone. Roy stood in front of a villa in the trade quarter. Slowly, the oak door creaked open and a shrill male voice spoke in delight. Roy, my boy, come in. Motherfucking destiny brought you to me at the right time. Onto the blue rug the witcher stepped and through the porch he crossed. The house blotted out most sunlight, and for a moment, darkness greeted him. But then the lights turned on, and the door swung shut all by itself. Within the spacious lobby stood a man in a saffron robe. He strode over to Roy, the magical lamps shining on him. His greasy, dark brown hair was plastered to the back of his head and dandruff covered his shoulders. An unkempt goatee hung from his chin, and his brow ridge jutted out. His nose was flat, and his face looked mousy. This man was like an anthropomorphic animal in a robe. Roy held back his laughter. Still as unique as usual, Kalkstein. The Witcher and the Alchemist shook hands. The Witcher's arm was powerful, while the other was covered with black hair. If Roy didn't know better, he would have thought he was shaking hands with a baboon. Kalkstein rolled his bloodshot eyes and his face broke into a bizarre grin. There was this weird excitement shining in his eyes. He led Roy to the sofa and poured him a cup of steaming black liquid that smelled like herbs. Been ten years since we last met, eh? So what brings you here? You want to learn more alchemy? Kalkstein pinched his goatee and looked at the young witcher from head to toe. And then he nodded. Heterochromatic eyes, body stronger than a bull's, and I can practically feel the magic coming from you. Did you go through a second trial? Must have improved then and you came at the right time. Kalkstein, it hasn't even been two years since we last met. Roy cocked his eyebrow and pulled a squirrel out of his hood. He placed it on the table and told it to test out that liquid for him. Ah, pardon my poor memory. Researchers have a bad habit of losing track of time. He looked away for a moment and continued calmly. But that's not the point. Point is, I ran into some trouble, and I need someone strong to help me out but I can't be arsed to put up a formal request, so can you help me out here? He scratched his head, and dandruff flew everywhere like snow. I can teach you some advanced ed alchemy techniques in return. A minute, please. I didn't come here to learn. It's about something else. Time is money to him. Guess I don't have to beat around the bush. He cut to the chase. I'd like you to improve the trial of the grasses for me, but you might have to move to Novigrad for that. Kalkstein tilted his head and held his right hand beside his ear. He huddled closer to the witcher and asked, What'd you say? You might have to move to Novigrad. And what do you want me to do? Improve the trial of the grasses. 
The smile was wiped off Kalkstein's face. He put his hands on his hip, his beady eyes going as wide as they could. With wariness in his eyes, Kalkstein stared at Roy. It was a simple question, but Kalkstein made it look like it was a matter of life or death. Roy, too, kept his silence. A smile curled his lips, and he stared back at the alchemist with genuine plea in his eyes. Thirty seconds later, Kalkstein shook his head. Not interested. My request and yours are two different things entirely. If you help me out, you can have anything you want, but not that. I can't waste a year on this. That's twelve months, fifty-two weeks, three hundred and sixty-five days. He spat a string of numbers, but his eyes did not leave the Witcher. In the end, he raised his voice. That's about a hundred thousand orins. Roy gasped. Wow, he's demanding. Ten thousand orins, Roy haggled curtly. What'd you say? If you help us, I'll pay you ten thousand orins. I can feel the savings. It's even less than what I proposed to Coral. Kalkstein froze for a moment, but his hand trembled. Shock and humiliation welled in his heart, and he hissed. You think this is a market, boy? What are you, a merchant? A ninety percent cut is ridiculous. Do you have any idea how much I can make in one minute? Well, if you can't do it, then you'll have to find someone else to do your request. Roy shook his head regrettably. He picked Griffin up, but he noticed something wrong with it. Oi, wake up! The squirrel stood on his palm, holding his index finger with its two little paws. It was wobbling and shuffling around, and Roy saw it burp. Don't worry, I put some dwarven liquor in that. It's probably drunk. Kalkstein snapped his fingers, and a soft meow came from the shadows of the second floor. Down came a fat black cat. It attempted its best catwalk and leapt onto the table before the fireplace. The cat raised its tail high up into the air and meowed once more. Hey, Sandrew, you got fat. Life has been well for you, I see. Roy rubbed Sandrew's belly, and the cat kept stretching its paw at the drunk griffin. Apparently, it could recognize its old friend. Leave your pet in Sandrew's care, Roy. I guarantee no harm will come to it, or I'll be your slave. Now let's talk about my request. You'll love the reward. Not interested. Do you have any idea how much I can make in a minute? I am not going to waste my time here. Novigrad calls, Roy mocked. He stood up and rubbed Sandrew's whiskers, holding Griffin by its bushy tail and swaying it before the cat. Kalkstein winced, his golden tooth shining under the lamp. He held his fists together and contemplated his options. Finally, he said, Fine, you little tyke. If you can finish this job, I'll help you out with the trial, free of charge, but only for a year. Once it's up, I'm leaving. I have other fish to fry. It was Roy's turn to be surprised. Never did he expect the mad alchemist to relent without much resistance. I take it this is a difficult mission? He placed Griffon on Sandrew's back, and the cat darted off to the second floor. So, what kind of bird are you turning me into this time? I'd is slightly more difficult than your last mission. Kalkstein rubbed his fingers together. But your magic feels so powerful, more powerful than most witchers. I'd wager you possess unusual strength. With my exquisite equipment and potions, I'm sure you can get me a living sample. No, I am but a regular witcher who does not charge into imminent danger. I have a bad feff, eeling about this. So tell me, what's the target this time? A higher vampire. Silence fell upon the room. The only sound was the alchemist's heartbeats. Roy stared into his beady eyes, trying to see if he was joking. I am not joking. Your target this time is a noble of the bloodsuckers, a higher vampire that possesses the appearance of a regular human. Roy kept quiet and tried to leave. Hey, wait! Wait, you bloodsucker! Sweat poured forth from Kalkstein's head, but he managed to pull Roy back down. The young witcher rubbed his cheeks and heaved a sigh. Be it as it may, his recent power-up still might not be enough for him to wage battle against a higher vampire. Their stats were ridiculously high, at least thirty points in dexterity alone. That was double what Roy had. But he was tempted. He needed the blood of a higher vampire to strengthen his own elder blood. And yet he faked a sigh of resignation. So tell me, you brilliant alchemist. What kind of research are you doing this time, and where did you find this higher vampire? Ha! I knew you weren't a coward like the others. Kalkstein scratched his balding hair and put his hands behind his back. Slowly, he circled the sofa. Not too long ago, the house of the Queen of the Night's owner contacted me. Shocked, Roy asked. You expect me to take her down in battle? No. You misunderstand me. 
Kalkstein shot Roy a look of surprise. I see you know who she really is. I am a monster hunter. Of course I know what she is, Roy said. She's a higher vampire. Yes, and a powerful one at that. Kalkstein nodded. To cross her would mean my death, so I kept an amicable relationship with her. She's a regular, buys a lot of aphrodisiacs from me and sells them to her customers. But I thought she was a pacifist? Roy asked. Technically, yes. She hides well, and she never breaks any law, never kills any innocents. She employs a more peaceful way to get her food. A way that's fun, so to speak. And she never oversteps her boundaries. And so, she has lived among us safely for decades. Roy heaved a sigh of relief. This part was exactly like how he remembered, but the Queen of the Night's underlings were humans, not Bruxa. At least that was what he knew. If she had employed Bruxa, the officials would have sniffed her out immediately. I am curious about them. I'd like to dissect one and see what they're made of. A nigh-invincible body is something worth researching, but never would I make a move against them, Kalkstein said warily. She has an equally powerful lover residing in Fenkarn. Not to mention she's a generous customer. Unless absolutely necessary, I'd like to stay on good terms with her. Huh. So her lover is Rageous the Barber, I guess. But I really want a specimen to examine. It's an even more tempting subject than the Lady of the Lake. He stared at the corner of the room, muttering to himself. But making a move against the Lady is equally foolhardy. Not too long ago, the Queen of the Night purchased top-quality black blood, blood witchers use against vampires. Oh, don't look so surprised. I'm more than 200 years old. Of course I'd have picked up a trick or two. But then it begs the question, who would she be poisoning with that? It sounded like a question for Roy, but the young witcher thought Kalkstein was also talking to himself. And so I conducted some investigations of my own, and I found out about some murders, murders that took place in rural Vizima. The victims were torn apart like they were eaten by feral beasts, and the Queen of the Night would make her appearance at the crime scenes with the black blood she bought from me. So another higher vampire has made its appearance in Vizima? Roy blurted. Some uninvited guest came and broke all the laws, killed innocents, and sucked their blood without a care in the world, and its actions angered her. Kalkstein clapped loudly. I expected no less from a monster hunter. That was the conclusion I had arrived to as well. A new higher vampire has made its appearance, and it has crossed a local. This is my chance. It is possible that a lower vampire might be the criminal, or perhaps it was a werewolf. None of those would draw her eyes to them, Kalkstein argued adamantly. Trust me, Roy, my instincts are never wrong. The killer must be a higher vampire, and I want to capture the intruder, imprison it, and make it my perpetual test subject. Bright lights shone within the mad alchemist's eyes. He looked like a starving man who just saw a feast unfurling right in front of him. He was trembling uncontrollably, his voice filled with near fanaticism. A higher vampire can last me for half a century. I, the great Kalkstein, shall leave my peers in the dust and become the first mage to research the magical creature called Higher Vampire. Full marks for bravery, Kalkstein. But think long and hard. There's a reason why your peers wouldn't attack a higher vampire. Roy crossed his arms and destroyed Kalkstein's fanaticism without a shred of hesitation. You can't kill a higher vampire with any regular methods we know. Imprisoning one is playing with fire at close range while you have kerosene smeared all over yourself. If it escapes, the results will not be pretty, and I'm talking about a Vizima-level threat. You have heard of this near-immortal species as well. Aren't you the least bit curious about their secrets? If you can imbibe the trial with some of their powers... Roy made that assumption and ran some tests in his head, and his heart skipped a beat. Risk is part and parcel of research. The goading went one. This might be a once-in-a-lifetime chance, and I'm not about to give up. If you find out where it is and manage to capture it, I'll share some of the research results and work for you for a year. Why don't you ask the Queen of the Night for help, then? You're both interested in the intruder. I did, but regrettably, she wouldn't let me take it. My guess, some powerful restriction of their race is prohibiting them from doing so. And that's understandable. No matter how brutal or unreasonable that higher vampire is, she would not let anyone dissect her kind. 
Only a traitor would do that. Kalkstein shook his head again. And that's why I need your help. Silence took over for a moment. Roy still had his concerns. I'm no match for a higher vampire in battle, especially a one-on-one -on -one fight. Don't worry, I'll be helping you. Kalkstein took a deep breath. With confidence in his heart, he said, My items and your prowess are top-notch even by themselves. But combined, combined, we will be unstoppable. And no need to hold back for my sake. Just go all in and incapacitate it. Cut its head off, pull its heart out, what do I care? Turn it into mincemeat and I'll still take it. So the mad alchemist will be helping me on this dangerous hunt. A hunt for a higher vampire that has killed innocents, a raging urge welled within Roy's heart, telling him to test the limits of his abilities with this battle. Once again, he turned his sights to Kalkstein, a deep frown furrowing his forehead. I make no guarantees. I will do this to the best of my abilities, but if anything happens, my safety comes first. And we'll have to sign a contract. A fair contract. The items you provide for the hunt must be a part of the reward we agreed upon, and no refunds on that part. Kalkstein looked reluctant, but he gritted his teeth and his face contorted with greed. You have a deal.